much as you like, my dear. No one can hear you here. Ah. Why, why have you strapped me to this operating table? Call it an old man's whim. <laughs> All right, why have you strapped me to this old man's whim? <laughs> and what? What? with that little black box. Don't worry, my dear, you won't feel a thing. I just attach a wire here, a wire there, and then I turn this knob and... This is the BBC. Ladies and gentlemen, it's <laughs> down the hall. No, no, anything but that. <laughs> yes, it's round the horn. This is the witching hour, the time that ghoulies and ghosties and long-legged beasties walk abroad. And they're not bad judges, because here is Kenneth Hall. Hello, and welcome to the show. Well, now, as this is the first of the series, here are the answers to last week's questions. <laughs> Complete the following similes, and the answers were as a brush, like the clappers, and as a coot. <laughs> now, I got several correct answers, and a letter from a firm of solicitors threatening legal proceedings and representing a Mr. A. Coot. <laughs> Apparently, it's quite untrue, as he was at home in bed at the time, and he sent a photograph to prove it, taken at home. In bed. <laughs> At the top. <laughs> right now, Smith. Armpit Theatre presents a gripping story of German air aces in World War I. Cheaper than the Blue Max, Armpit Theatre presents the Plastic Max. <laughs> My name is Heinrich von Horstwessel und Klagenfurst, Reich Stiefelsermund, Platzervogel, Stumpenrock and Gildenplatzer. There's a hyphen in it somewhere, but I never can find it. Now, the year was 1918, and I was the commandant of a German fighter squadron on the Western Front. The war was going badly. Our planes were in a shocking state, and we were sending up anything that could fly, patched up albatrosses, clapped out halberstats, and we even tied wings on the squadron goat. But you can't do the things with a goat you can do with a sock with camel. <laughs> and if the planes were bad, the pilots were worse, with no experience of combat. One morning, there was a knock on my office door. Come in. Overlight in the grass, Michael, reporting, sir. As you were. As I was what, sir? As you were when I first met you. The moonlight gleaming through your sauerkraut. <laughs> A new batch of pilots has arrived. Ask them to goose step this way. In here, pig dogs. I zwei, I zwei, and... Grossbagel, call the roll. Yes, sir. Von Schickset. Yup. Adolf Steiglitz. Yup. Uh, Brickman Gossa Damerung. Yup. Cohen. Hello. <laughs> I'm, uh, I'm a little bit worried about Cohen. Oh. Why, <laughs> sir? He's the new chaplain. <laughs> You're a royal man, Captain. That's right, you're German. <laughs> who, uh, who was this young foot wangler who stood before me? He was a different cut, of a different cut to the others. The others all had duelling scars on their cheeks. He had one down his back. Tall, blonde, arrogant, handsome almost to a fault. Go on, that's my heart good to hear it. <laughs> Oh, that's all there is. That's all there is? Yeah. The main thing about my peeling elfin face, my dough-like orbs, my fashionably flat figure, my cultish legs, isn't there anything about that? Well, they must have forgotten to put it in. I could have been another Twiggy. <laughs> <laughs> Too late, you were twigged long ago, Jack. <laughs> May we continue? Oh, don't let me stop you, Jack. Right. <laughs> Oh, sorry, I'm sure. Fort Wanger, Fort you're looking at me strangely. Yes, sir, it's those medals you're wearing. What are they? Well, this one is the Kaiser's Medal for conspicuously helping old ladies across the Unterdenlinden. And this one is my Yogi Bear Club badge and bar. 
And this is Germany's highest award, the Plastic Max. Oh, I should like to wear the Plastic Max. You, you, you have to be an ace to win the Max like Captain Horseman Cut Powder. He? Is he stationed here? Yes, see that tiny speck up there? Yes. Well, why be awful is those damn flies? <laughs> they get everywhere. But here he is coming into land now. That's von Kuckpowder, the greatest ace in Germany. Oh, what a pilot! He can make that plane do anything! See the way he's weaving his way through that herd of cows on the runway! And look at that! <laughs> A perfect pancake landing. <laughs> Cook! Jawohl! We'll be having sliced beef for dinner. The mess. <laughs> Some hours later. The pilots are discussing their day's adventures. And there I was, just north of Mons, and I saw this dog fight. I climbed, banked, and threw a bucket of water over there. What? I hear the English are using tiger moths. Uh, how can we combat them? We're being issued with tiger mothballs. I didn't, I didn't know tiger moths. Had Waiter! <laughs> had been invented yet. Yes, sir. Uh, more beer, sir? Yes, bring us two steins. Uh, here you are, sir. I'm Epstein. I'm Goldstein. <laughs> Boy, are we in the wrong plot. I think the Americans have entered the war. Why do you say that? I nearly shot down Ben Lyon today. <laughs> Excuse me, sir. Yes, Sir Wangler. Is that von Cockpowder over there? The one with the window in his eye? That's a monocle, yes. Oh, yeah. I'll introduce you. Von uh, Cockpowder, oh. I'd like to present, uh, in association with S.A. Golinski, <laughs> Hans uh, Futwangler. Please to meet you, Cockpowder. Not plain Cockpowder. Mm. Can't you tell by the way I stand, the way I move, the way I hold a cigarette, that I am a fawn? You. <laughs> You can't blame him. It takes Vaughn to recognize another. <laughs> he's, a, he's a commoner. <laughs> and they don't come much commoner than him. <laughs> you Junkers are all the same. You're also proud because you wear the plastic Max. But I'll win the Max myself one day. I'll shoot down more planes than you. Then it'll be Junkers go home. <laughs> <laughs> the aristocrat Harry smiled icily, bowed, clicked his dentures, turned... <laughs> And Goose stepped out of the mess. But fate had not finished its grim gavotte. The tragedy lurked in the wings. Enter Betty Marsden, all eyes and teeth. Many of them her own. <laughs> Ach, darling, I was so lonely without you. How about a little drink if you are leapling? Oh, Hans, this is my wife, Brunhilde. Brunhilde, Hans of Footwangler. Come here, woman, kiss me. Mm. But my husband. Damn your husband. I love you. Oh, darling, darling, I love you too. Run away with me. Be mine. Yes, mm. yes, my darling. Yes, <laughs> yes, yours. I'll be yours forever. <laughs> oh, good. For a moment, I thought you two mightn't get on. <laughs> the next day, preparing for the Dawn Patrol. Oh, this will be your plan, Fort Bangler. What is it's it? It's a Douglas Smith Mark II. Now just uh, try the throttle. Rum, rum, fat, fat, cuss, plot. <laughs> I need turning over. That, that is the understatement of the year. <laughs> you can't send a boy like me up in a crate like him. You. <laughs> You've got to go. There's only you and Von Kuckpowder left. You're to keep in touch with each other by means of this. Now, this is the latest example of German technological electronic know-how. What is it? Two old baked bean tins attached by a length of cotton. <laughs> Are you ready, von Kakpara? No, all here, Commandant. Good. The two pilots climbed into their machines, the mechanics swung the propellers, the planes taxied up the runway, and Furtwängler and von Kuckpowder took off looking like two great birds. It's a disgrace. <laughs> Red Leader to Red Fox 2, are you receiving me? Red Fox 2 to Red Leader. I am receiving you loud and clear. I am flying at 5,000 feet over Cologne. Oh, 
What's the weather like there in Cologne? Very good, Jean. We've got a bit... <laughs> Request here from Sapper Loomis of <laughs> of B A O R fourteen for the best mum in the whole world, and Granny and the twins, and he's asked for Kathy Kirby's latest number. Have you got it? <laughs> oh yes, we've all got her number. <laughs> Look out, Red Fox Two, on your tail! A stop with camel at five o'clock. Can you see it? I can't see it at five o'clock. Tell it my place. Drink is six. <laughs> the English fine is diving on you. You don't stand a chance. Two vicars blazing on one wing, two rabbis on the other in their arms. <laughs> Here come more. Look, behind the camel, a walrus. And look, elephants, clowns. Yeah, it's a flying circus. <laughs> They're turning tail. How many did you get? I'm not sure. My monocle is misted up. Ah, oh, that's better. I'm spy with my little eye. And I got four. Does that qualify me for the max? No. For four, you only get a set of raffia table mats. <laughs> I am still a better fighter pilot than you are. You? <laughs> Don't make me laugh. Can you fly under that bridge? Of course I can. Here goes. Correction! <laughs> Meanwhile, back at the base. Oh, where are they? They've been gone hours. Where's Hans? You love him, don't you? Yes. Yes, I want him. I need Don't, him. don't, my dear. I know what you're going to say. I can't help it. I need Hans to make somebody happy. <laughs> <laughs> Me. See, there's only one plane coming back. It's a riddle Douglas Smith coming in on the wing of the prayer. Chug, 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 splat, splat, stream, stream. <laughs> What's the matter, Smith? I can't lower my flaps. <laughs> Poor Hans is in trouble. Hand me that big bean tin. I'll talk him down. Hello. Hello, Hans, darling. Brunhilde, I'm in trouble. My undercarriage has been shot through. My engine's on fire and I've got chap legs. <laughs> Don't worry. I'll guide you in. Left hand down. Cut your engine. Fat, fat. Silence. Left rudder. Left rudder. Steady, steady. Now back a bit. My rudder has dropped off. My wings have dropped off. My propeller has dropped off. And there's flames licking round my joystick. What am I going to do? <laughs> going to do? Crash. Oh, all right then. Oh, is he? Yes, my dear, look, no hands. <laughs> well, here now the Fraser Hayes Four have been putting their heads together with a sticky tape and have come up with a plan for the perfect murder of more. Ladies and gentlemen, the Fraser Hayes Four.
the Round the Horn colour supplement. Here, first, Sunday Night Personality Seamus Android reports from Pinewood Film Studios. All right. Hello there. Well, now, uh... <laughs> All right. Now, I'm here... <laughs> for the young actress whom I have often... <laughs> As I know you have. Indeed, we all have at one time or another. And in fact, has won many awards for it. So here... So here with me personally herself, in person, in an impromptu, unscripted, off-the-cuff spun... I can't quite read it. A, a, oh, tenuous interview. It's Leggy Gamma, Miss Gammy Lagan. Uh, now, tell me, Miss uh, Lagan, to what do you attribute your overnight success? Oh, I see, and very charming too. Uh, <laughs> with that, back to the studio. Thank you, uh, Seamus Android. <laughs> yeah, thanks, Seamus. Oh, as you are known to millions of television viewers, chairman of the board. Now, <laughs> now our What's On in London feature brought to you yet again by Brad Smallpiece. Ah, uh, has a loose end. <laughs> There's no hint of activities for the visitor to London to amuse himself with. There's jam, bang, or dipping at the sailors' hostel, Glyndebourne. <laughs> Nark fettering on ice at Billingsgate. Demonstration of brass rubbing by the Reverend Lippy Gonga Margulis at the Municipal Slipper Bar at Paddington. Uh, but I myself would make a beeline for Tulse Hill and the stripper armour Darby and Joan Club. <laughs> where the Bishop of Snaresbrook will cut the tape and thus inaugurate his mile of hedgehogs. <laughs> yes, well, good luck, Bishop, and keep taking the tablets. <laughs> well, now the colour supplement turns its attention to the horse, its place in English life. The English have always been keen judges of the qualities of a horse and are never more shrewd than when horse trading. I seem you be a good judge of horse flesh, squire, and old Jem wouldn't guide ye wrong, sir. I tell ye, you won't go far wrong with this one here. His father was a derby winner, and there's breeding here and class and quality. This be the finest horse you'll see round these parts. Well, sir, can we strike a bargain? Well, yes, I, I'll, I'll have a quarter of a pound. <laughs> Don't bother to wrap it, the cat's not that particular. <laughs> it's sad to reflect that the old village smithy is a thing of the past. What a picture the old smith used to make standing outside the forge, touching his forelock to the fancy. Or was it, uh, <laughs> Was it touching his fancy to the forelock? <laughs> well, whichever way it was, it was very picturesque. Ah, the old smithy. Hello oh, there, blacksmith! Would you shoe this horse? Ah, uh, young master. Go on, shoe! Get out of it! <laughs> oh, thanks. I've been trying to get rid of that horse for weeks. <laughs> the English love stories about horses, hence the popularity of such films as National Velvet and Son of Flicker. Gee, Gramps, why have we got... <laughs> why have we got to shoot Flicker? <laughs> well, son, it ain't easy, but a man... <laughs> man's got to do what a man's got to do. And I know what I got to do. And... And then, are you going to shoot Flicker? <laughs> yup. <laughs> Old creature ain't no use no more. Broke a leg. Got a shooter. But Gramps, gee shucks, gosh jolly, golly. <laughs> Do you have to shoot her? Afraid so, sir. But you said I could. <laughs> uh, there she is. Flick all friend. Guess it's the end of the trail, old buddy. Don't, don't look, son. <laughs> Goodbye, Flicker. But poor. Do you have to? 
couldn't you just put my leg in splints? <laughs> It gets me right here. Oh, dear, just as well as it isn't television. Now, many songs have been written about horses. Horsey, keep your tail up. Bless this horse. Horsey, horsey, don't you stop. Don't you ever stop, but of course they don't, do they? If they do, it's a sign it's going to rain. No, no. Here now is a man, here now is a man who's a positive storehouse. I think it says storehouse. It's rather a... <laughs> Sort of thick blue line through it. It's difficult to read. A storehouse of ineffable folk songs, the effable rambling Sid Rumper. Allow me, dearie, oh, for I'll tether my nudges to a grouting pole <laughs> while the old grey mare is grunging in the meadow. Yeah, and better there than here. Ah, yeah. ah, <laughs> ah, precisely. It would only upset the studio manager. It would indeed. <laughs> now, uh, I imagine you're going to sing us a song about a horse. Yes, tis a song about the Somerset Nog. Nog? Yes, so called because it's a cross between a nag and a dog. Oh. <laughs> See, it's a half Suffolk punch and half Dachshund. It gets very foggy on the moors. Oh, <laughs> well, thank you for that piece of country law. <laughs> all right. That's all right. My song tells of a man who wants to go to the great fair at Ganderpoke Bog. Yes. And so he... Uh, uh, yeah, you've heard of it, have you? Yeah. <laughs> and so, so he, he asked the farmer, you see, for a loan of the nog, so he can take all his friends with him, and it proceeds in this fashion. <clears throat> reg pubes, reg pubes, <laughs> lend me your great nog. <laughs> Rollock me faucet and griddle me nose. For I want for to go to Gander Poke Bog <laughs> With Len Posset, Tim Screevy, the Reverend Phipps Peg Leg Loom Bucket, Sonny <laughs> Levi, Ginger Epstein Abel Seaman Truefit, Scotch Lil, Mrs Cattermole, Mouse Habit, Neep Thigh and Trust Pot Solicitors and Commissioners for O. <laughs> Are the Thundergast, Fat Alice, Con Mahoney, Yeti Rosencrantz, Futong Robinson, and Uncle Ted Willis, and, oh, and Uncle Ted Willis, and And thank you, Rambling Sid. I must admit, you sounded exactly like the back end of a phantom knob. <laughs> Romantic stories of horse riding abound in fiction. Here's an example of one such story. Hey, darling, you're back. Had a good ride? Oh, yes. I so love it. All alone, galloping along. There wasn't a soul about. I was watching from the window. You rode like the wind, your, your hair streaming out behind you. you. You looked as if you were part of the horse. Which part? <laughs> <laughs> I love you when you're so flippant. <laughs> and I love the way you handle your palfrey. Why don't, why don't you come out with me? Oh, you know I can't ride myself. I've tried, but I keep falling off. <laughs> I, I'd much rather... I'd much rather watch you, if you don't mind, Lady Godiva. <laughs> Not at all, Peeping Tom. <clears throat> well, so much for horse lovers and so much for our show. We'll be back again next week when with yeah, me... Yeah, yeah, wait a minute. Yes. Yeah, what about Jewel and me? Yes. Where what about us? Go on, sir, tell him. Oh, well, I got me wild down. All yeah. right. <laughs> Oh, what is it? What about our parts? parts. Haven't we got parts? Oh, I'm afraid not. What about no. our parts? No. What, no. no jewel and sand? Well, that's a disgrace. Grace, disgrace. disgrace. 
We are much love characters. Much we love are. characters, we are. Much. Gifted artists, Gifted. aren't we? Yes. Nothing for us, no. we're all dragged up special. Yeah, sure. <laughs> I mean, no jewel at his peace dress. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Show him. <laughs> Lovely. I'll see it later. All right. I'm sorry, but the I'm sorry, but the writers couldn't think of anything for you. Couldn't, couldn't think of anything. Oh. oh, don't be ridiculous. Easy to fit us in. Easy. It? Slip us in. Yes. Anywhere. anywhere. <laughs> oh, I think it's disgraceful. Yeah. But, well, well, no. You could have had us where we was Eskimos, and I could have said, "I'm going to the igloo for a egg." Yeah. <laughs> We could have been in a railway booking office and I could have said, Jules checking his departures and looking up his bread shore. <laughs> no, 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 no. <laughs> I don't think so. The audience may have seen a secondary meaning. Them? Secondary meaning? What? They don't even see the first meaning. <laughs> Laugh at anything that might be dirty, don't yes. they? Disgusting. No, don't put yourself out. No, I come won't. On, come no. on, don't plead with him. Well, I won't. It cheapens you. It cheapens you know. me, doesn't yes. it? You're quite right. Yes. If he don't want us, he don't want us. No. And that's all there is to it. Yes. We'll go where we are appreciated. That's true. Yeah, we'll try that. I'm sorry, I'll read that again. They're yes. grateful for any old rubbish there, aren't they? Yes. Come on, it's a disgrace, isn't it? It's a bird of arms. It's treated like a load of rubbish. It's a disgrace. Grace. Yes, well. <laughs> You know, I have a feeling they'll be back, rather in the way that the seaweed always comes back to the beach at Worthing. <laughs> well, we'll be back anyway. See you next week. Goodbye. That was Round the Horn, starring Kenneth Horn, with Kenneth Williams, Hugh Paddock, Betty Marsden and Bill Pertwee. On the musical side, you heard the Fraser Hayes Four and Edwin Braden on the Hornblowers. The script was written by Barry Talk and Marty Feldman, and the show is produced by John Simmons. cannot be with us today, please be up standing and raise your stirrup cups. The toast is John Peel in his coat so gay. We've all got his number, dear. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, I give you jorocks, with which I would like a couple round the hall. And welcome to the show. Well, now, here are the answers to last week's questions. First, the where do you find it question. Well, the answer came in several parts as follows. Wound round a sailor's leg. <laughs> on uh, top of the wardrobe. Floating in the bath. Under a prize bull. And in a lay-by on the Watford bypass. <laughs> At least I found one there. I couldn't use it. It was covered... <laughs> It was covered in verdigris. Never mind. I gave it to the scouts, actually, and they exhibited proudly next to a ghetto type of Baden Pound's woggle. Now, <laughs> finally, the what was wrong with this picture question, where I showed you a photograph and asked you to pick out the deliberate mistakes on it. Well, uh, most of you realised that Queen Victoria was wearing an Arsenal football shirt in the picture. <laughs> Quite ridiculous. It should, of course, have been Bolton Wanderers. <laughs> The sheep bottom right shouldn't have been wearing jockey shorts. Greyhounds, of course, do not have antlers. And the vicar's miniskirt was in the wrong tartan. <laughs> now, the prize for the winning entry has been sent to Mrs. J. Monk's Haunch, Seaview Cottage, 
Tibet. <laughs> and is, as promised, the Bank of England nude calendar <laughs> featuring Mr. Lippincott, the ex-governor, in a series of saucy poses, <laughs> representing the 12 months of the fiscal year. And so, so to our new uh, feature, Smith. Smith, wend your way over to the microphone and make the announcement, will you? Here he comes, Douglas Smith, the well-known happening. <laughs> <laughs> and now, ladies and gentlemen, it's... Armpit Theatre! BBC, the studios that gave you tales of adventure and swashbuckling romance like The Count of Monte Cristo, now presents Kenneth Horne as D'Artagnan in a special production of The Three Musketeers. My name is D'Artagnan. Alice D'Artagnan. <laughs> But that's another story. I'm, uh, I'm half bourbon with a dash of ginger. Uh, that, too, is another story. My, my father was a small landowner in Gascony. He was three inches high, to be exact. My family had fallen on hard times. Not for us delicacies like frog's legs. We had to eat the rest of the frog. Small wonder my mother and father croaked when I was still quite young. In 1662, I decided to go to Paris to seek my fortune. I made my way to a low tavern in the Rue de la Danny, the main drag. <laughs> and tethered my old nag to a hitching post. All right, you stay there, Granny. I'll get you a pint of stout and a packet of cheese and onion flavoured escargot. Thank you, Alice. You always was a good granddaughter to me. And that is yet another story. <laughs> Perhaps you should have told that one, Ducky. It's getting more laughs. <laughs> I flung open the door of the low tavern and swaggered in on my hands and knees. It was a very low tavern. <laughs> at the bar stood three mustachioed gallants with swords at their side. The tallest of the trio wore a gay cockade in his hat. I stared at him for a moment. He spoke. Are you staring at me, cockade? Yes. You're musketeers, aren't you? Hi, Cully. I'm Porthos, and this man at me elbow is Arthos. Oh. Oh, I'm sorry, in this night for a moment I couldn't tell Arthas from your elbow. <laughs> I'm here. This is Aramis. He gestured with his gleaming epée at the gloomy, saturnine man at his side. He had the face of an unfrocked priest. <laughs> and, the, and the ears of an unfrocked rabbi. <laughs> which he carried in a matchbox at his waist. <laughs> he extended his hand to seven years with options and kissed me on both cheeks. Enchanté, mon brave. That is your actual French. <laughs> New Psalms, as you may have gathered, your actual musketeers. Yeah, no. The King's Own? Well, no, not for keeps. <laughs> Our motto is one for all and all for one. And I'm one. <laughs> I, uh... I don't quite follow. Well, he's one, and he's one and all. Well, I'd like to be one. Well, first you have to prove yourself. Can you ride a horse? Can you fight off 20 men at once? Can you make love to a beautiful woman? Well, not all at the same time, but uh, <laughs> anything you can do, I can do better. I can do anything better than you. No, you can't. Yes, I can. No, you can't. No, you can't. Yes, I can. <laughs> Gascon can speak like that to a musketeer. I challenge her to a duel. And I. And I. To the death. To the death. To the death. To the death. At dawn tomorrow. At dawn. At dawn. Oh, well, could you make it 12 or 12 30? <laughs> I'm having my hair done. <laughs> and Vidal gets furious if I cancel. <laughs> Same here. So be it. <laughs> so, so be it tomorrow then, the shores and his head. I'll wait by the Eiffel Tower. But it won't be built for 300 years. I'm in no hurry. <laughs> but why fight on the Champs-Élysées? Because it's a dual carriageway. <laughs> there will now be a short musical interlude while the enormity of that joke sinks in. <laughs> Dawn, the next day. How about you? Ha-ha! <laughs> How about you? Oi! Alex, they haven't arrived yet. Oh. Oh, well, I'll have it myself then till they get here. Who there, 
Alaskan dog? No, 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 that's Granny the Wonder Horse. <laughs> a fine beast. Ah. Oh, here come Porthos and Anubis. Will you fight us one at a time or all together? All together. Sing something simple as time goes by. They came at me, their rapiers gleaming. Porthos was nicked but remanded for a doctor's report. <laughs> Animus was next. He lunged at me deftly, flashing his ape. I parried and lunged quickly. And after a quick lunge, I stepped into the library for a nap, but he wasn't to be put off. He showed me what he was made I'll of. I'll show you what I'm made of. Look. Good heavens, skin. <laughs> Take that. Ah, 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 ah miscreant. Oh. Ah. Touché! Ah, is he? Is he? Yes, he is. He's overacting. <laughs> but he'll soon be all right. Now, you, Arthos. Oh, look out! Oh, look out! Oh, 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 look out! Oh, look out. Oh. Here come the Cardinal's guards. Ain't too shortage of cast. There'll be a short pause while everyone changes to guards. <laughs> Cardinal's guards, for it was they, rushed at the musketeers with savage oaths. The fight was on. Back to back, face to face, cheek to cheek, up against the wall, they did what they had to. <laughs> Arthos, Porthos, and Aramis cut and thrust with a will, while Alice was parrying one of the guards. <laughs> a musketeer's life is terribly hard, says Alice. <laughs> Finally outnumbered, they were forced to retreat. Led by D'Artagnan, the musketeers leapt onto Granny the Wonder Horse, and with a cry of... Hey, ho, Granny! They rode off to the Tuileries. Oh, why are we going there? To get twilled, you idiot! <laughs> Meanwhile, the decadent court of the effete King Louis, word, had reached the Queen. I heard that, Lou! That's a nice word to use in front of your Queen. That's nice language for the King of France to use, that is. I'm sorry, Queenie, I dropped the orb on me toe. Oh, well, I'm royalty, I am. Oh, I've got yeah. breeding. Yes. If you put a pea under me mattress, I'd feel it. Yes. It'd give me jip all night. Oh, you? shut your cake hole, oh. you great fat nose pot. Oh. Uh, pea under your mattress. You, you could put two stone of King Edwards in your pit and you'd still sleep like an og. Oh, I'm an Habsburg, I am, and don't you forget I'll well, button your Habsburg lip. Your Majesty, His Eminence, the Cardinal Richelieu, craves audience. Ah, oh, the Eminence grieves himself. Show him in. Oi, this way, your greasy eminence. <laughs> your Majesty. <laughs> I have a complaint. The uh, next line was cut by the Minister of Health. <laughs> on the grounds that it was infecting the lines around it. <laughs> you could see this scene as the cardinal with his colourful habit, for which I believe he's receiving treatment, <laughs> advances into the stately throne room with its priceless tapestries, gilt caryatids and aubusson carpets woven by hand. They don't use needles, they have long pointed fingers. <laughs> what a colourful spectacle with the deep crimson of the curtains set off by the silver gleam of the simulated nickel plate. Fully transistorized Japanese mini commode and teas made. <laughs> Obtained for only 50,000 coupons from Podgast's Navy Cut Cigarettes. Deeply satisfying Podgast with the smoked salmon flavored filter. <laughs> Buy some for Louis. <laughs> the Three Musketeers, part three. You, you wouldn't have liked part two, it was all plot. <laughs> the wicked cardinal, jealous of the queen's influence on the king, plans to discredit her. Shame, shame, Knowing shame. that he has given a diamond necklace as a token of her favours to the Duke of Buckingham, he persuades the king to hold an enormous ball. Don't drop it, Louis. And the queen must wear the necklace. Meanwhile, on the next page, the musketeers are celebrating their victory over the cardinal's guards. 
A toast to the king. Oh, the, king. The, king. the king. The king. To our new found friend, D'Artagnan, the swiftest swordsman in Gascony. Here's to D'Artagnan, the high-speed Gascon. <laughs> I'm very, very honored, gentlemen. Young D'Artagnan, you shall live with us from now on. Come on, I'll show you my quarters. Yeah. <laughs> All right, I'll show you mine. <laughs> These clothes you wear, they're not fit a barrel for a gentleman. We'll take you to the King's Old Tailors, Berman's Theatrical Misfits and the Hundred Years' War surplus store. Yes. <laughs> you have a fine purple cloak, a lace jabot, sheer silk hose, and as fine a codpiece as any gentleman could wish, <laughs> together with four pennies of chips and a pickled onion. <laughs> High boots, a fine ostrich plume in your hat. Oh, looking like that everywhere you go, men will envy you and women desire you. Oh, the other way round. <laughs> <laughs> One thing, D'Artagnan. Yes, what is it? In that clobber, don't go near the docks on a Saturday night. <laughs> Entrez! I am Her Majesty's Lady in Waiting. Oh, well, call me, Mrs. Woman. We won't keep you waiting long. <laughs> uh, yeah. I have a message for the Queen. She must see you at once. It's a matter of life and death. What does the Queen want to see the Musketeers about? Where does the mysterious Cardinal fit in? Will Snowy and Jock be in time? How does Lord Otto Mousechauser fit into the bacon slicer? What is the sound of one hand clapping? Can you look me in the eyes and say you love me? Tune in next week for episode two of The Three Musketeers. Well, there's nothing so bad it can't get worse, so here are the Fraser Hayes Four, three voices in perfect harmony to sing on a slow boat to China. <laughs> And now, the Round the Horn Colour Supplement. Now, this part of the show can only be heard in colour. And like the newspaper supplements, it comes entirely free. So if you don't like it, well, don't come whining to us. So to our first item, Swinging London. Trendy columnist Brad Smallpiece with news of current events. Among the many exciting events to titillate the visitor of London this week are Formation Goat Nadrin for the Bulstrode Cup at the Wimbledon Palais. <laughs> Uh, armadillo bait in a Crafts, the ideal spotted dick exhibition at Olympia, and uh, floodlit horse massage at the Ivory Stadium. <laughs> but I myself would plump for the camping exhibition at the Marine Commando Club Paddington, <laughs> uh, weather and police permit in. Yes. Yes. <laughs> I shall make a beeline for it. The 
The colour supplement now turns its attention to a frequently criticised but essential part of the contemporary scene, the British judicial system. Now, every day at the Old Bailey, scenes like this are being enacted. Yes, I admit it, I killed her. I killed them all. They said I was mad. Me, mad, mad, mad am I. I'll show you, I'll kill you, I'll kill you all. Then we'll see who's mad. Ah! <laughs> Quite so, my lad. But uh, what about the accused? <laughs> and who do we revere more than the solid British Bobby? Uh, what is it, Constable? Uh, just breathe into this, will you, sir? Breathe into it? Don't argue, sir. Just breathe into this. Oh, all right. <sighs> now this one. Yeah, that's better. Can't stand cold gloves when I'm on point. <laughs> of course, there have been many folk songs written about the law, and here now to sing one is that doyen of folk singers, a man who has few peers, except through the window of the nurse's hostel in the Baltimore <laughs> Road. Your own, your very own, rambling Sid Rumper. Well, hello, me dearie, oh, for... For I dangle my grummet till my billy broils. <laughs> yeah, well, I'll have a cup if it's no trouble. Now, what song are you going to give us now? Uh, it's something I picked up down under. It is an Australian outlaw's song and tells of a squatter in the outback. Ah, I see. <laughs> Primitive plumbing. So some... <laughs> So some say. Do some. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, this swagman is in the bush camping by a billabong, and the billabong reports him to the police. And, <laughs> and up come the troopers. One, two, four, and. One, two, four. Oh, it was three's day off. Oh, yeah. So anyway, they catch him having a jumbuck in his tucker bag. <laughs> Well, it's better than a poke in the eye with a sharp stick, isn't it? <laughs> oh, precisely. So then he sings this haunting lament. Mm. <clears throat> Once long ago in the shade of a ghouly bush <laughs> Toast in his blood by the old faggot's glee <laughs> Rested a gander man, a noblin of his woggle iron, and stuffing a sheep in the old mill stream. <laughs> then up come the troopers and hung him by the billabong. They twisted his woggle irons one, two, and three. Now his ghost sits and moans as it grunges in his gander can. Old come a in his jumbuck with me. <laughs> Thank you, Rambling Sid, and keep taking the tablets. <laughs> now, uh, one thing about British law is the way it adapts to circumstances. As time changes, so does the law. For instance, 30 years ago, it was illegal to set fire to an orangutan within the precincts of Westminster Abbey on even dates. <laughs> but nowadays, there's no such stigma attached to such an act, except, of course, to the orangutan. And it's uh, similar with divorce. Now, in the 40s, these social complications were enormous as we illustrate with this excerpt from the 1942 production of Brief Ecstasy, starring Dame Celia Mole Strangler and aging juvenile Binky Huckerback. <laughs> uh, Fiona, I was asleep. No, Charles. Are you? No. <laughs> Neither am I. I can't get off. <laughs> I 
I keep thinking. Thinking? Thinking what? You know what I'm thinking. Yes, I know. I know you know. I know you know, I know. Yes, I know. But knowing doesn't help. Every night I lie here torturing myself. We're in an impossible position. <laughs> Give it time, Charles. If, if only your husband would divorce you. <laughs> but he won't. You know Roger. Yes, Roger. I'm sick of Roger. This is his house. I see him everywhere. Roger in the morning, Roger in the evening, Roger at supper time. <laughs> He'll always be between us, Fiona. Hold me, Charles. I can't. Somehow, whenever we're together, I feel he's there between us. Yes, yes. I feel that, too. Uh, what are we going to do, Fiona? Shall I speak to him? Yes, you must. You'll never get any peace. Very well, darling. Roger. Yes, love? Get up and make some cocoa, dear. We're trying to get some sleep. <laughs> From time to time, the most honest, law-abiding citizen gets entangled with the law. I did myself recently. Very uncomfortable it was. And I was uh, recommended to a fashionable firm of solicitors in Lincoln's Inn. The brass plate on the door read, Berna Law. <laughs> hello, anybody there? Oh, hello, I'm Julian. This is my friend Sandy. I've got me articles and he's taken silk. Frequently. <laughs> <laughs> well, Miss Drawn, how nice to valdi your dolly old eek again. Oh! What brings you trolling in here? Well, can you help me? I've erred. Yeah, we've all erred, Ducky. <laughs> I mean, it's common knowledge, isn't it, Joe? Oh, well, will you take my case? Well, it depends on what it is. We've got a criminal practice that takes up most of our time. <laughs> yes, but apart from that... <laughs> Legal advice. Oh, and he bowed. Oh, so all time has not withered nor custom staled his infinite variety. <laughs> <laughs> Just a minute. Now, what is it you've done? Well, though. No, I don't like to say. Oh, come no. on. No, yeah. no, I don't like Oh, to. come on, you can tell us. Yeah. And me have handled the most bizarre briefs. Nothing to show. <laughs> No. Well, look, it, it, it's here on this charge sheet. Let's have a vard. Oh, Jewel, look at this. Oh, no. <gasps> yeah. He did. He did. No. It's written down. Oh. oh. I mean, broad daylight. Oh. Outside the corner house. Oh. <laughs> Aren't you ashamed? Yes, but it is only a parking offence. Only? They're very hot on that. What do you think, Jewel? Well... Well, let me look up my talk. Mm, she's looking up his talk. Mm. Oh, sometimes it takes him hours to find what he's looking for. <laughs> well, oh. He wants a mirror. Yeah. <laughs> oh, he's found it. Well, uh, well, I recommend we try Per Virulium Ad Camforum Actus Injuria Linctus Est. Mm. That's your actual Latin. Yes, what does it mean? I don't know. I got it off a bottle of horse rub. <laughs> <laughs> it sounds good, though, doesn't it? How should we tackle it, Sand? I think we should plead insanity. Yes, but what about Mr. Orne? Oh, him. Oh, I'll defend him. Oh, I'll do my speech for the defence. Yes. Do you like to hear it? Yeah, yeah, I can't contain myself. Well, that's your problem, Ducky. <laughs> Go, Go on, do you please, Sand? Yes. Always oh, an eloquent pleader. I have. <laughs> of the poor one who stands before you. His lally's trembling. 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 Here. He, he has his share of guilt. But who is without it? Who? Who is without it? Who? We all have a bit. Every one of us. We have our share. Yeah. His only crime was that he loved, not wisely, but not too well. This, this kid never had a chance. No. Born on the wrong side of the tracks. Oh. Forced to take him washing. Wash Society drove him to a life of vice. I see. It's not this one who's on trial. It is all of us. Hallelujah. We, hallelujah. <laughs> we made him what he is without hope, without love, without hair. <laughs> 
give him a chance to become a useful chance. citizen again, a housewife and a mother, mother, so that he can look the world in the face and say, I name this ship HMS Ark Royal, and God bless all who sail in her. Bravo, sir! Bravo! Well done. Could have been a Queen's Council. <laughs> well, Mr. Hall, what do you say? Have you got Quentin Hogg's phone number? <laughs> well, they did defend me in the end, and I got off. They got six months. <laughs> but that's still another story. Well, that brings us to the end of the show, except for this week's mystery noise. Now, what is it that goes... <laughs> If you know, please drop a line to me, care of round the horn, and mark your envelopes clearly in block letters. <laughs> Cheerio. See you next week. That was Round the Horn, starring Kenneth Horn, with Kenneth Williams, Hugh Paddock, Betty Marsden, and Bill Pertwee. On the musical side, you heard the Fraser Hayes Four and Edwin Braden and the Hornblowers. The script was written by Barry Took and Marty Feldman, and the show is produced by John Simmon. My lords, ladies and gentlemen, bride of the gorilla, son of Flicker, free stream. Jill Wills, Dr. Deco, Wilfred Eyed White, <laughs> fellow member of the Honor Film Club, your host, Count Dracula, wishes to take plasma with all the ladies present. <laughs> Please charge your smoking beakers. The toast is the thing from the Black Lagoon, with whom I would like to couple Ken Dodd and, of course, round the hole. <laughs> Hello again, welcome to the show. Now, first, here are the answers to last week's questions. First, the cooking question. Well, the answer was in several parts as follows. Not with a French dressing, not in a hot oven, and never on any account in a casserole unless they're wrapped in tinfoil and hung for three days first. <laughs> At least that's what Fanny Craddock said, and she added, you can get them frozen if the weather turns nippy. <laughs> Next, next, the legendary pears question. Well, the answers were, one, Troilus and Cressida, two, Scylla and Charybdis, three, Ursula and Andres. Now, I would have accepted Damon and Pythias, but on no account Mike and Bernie Winters, as they're still alive, so I'm told. Finally, the, uh, finally, the complete the song titles question. The first one was, there's a hole in my... <laughs> well, the answer was bucket, dear Liza, and I got your letter, Mr. Grunt Futtock. <laughs> and while I accept the geographical accuracy of your reply, it's nothing to make a great fuss about. <laughs> now, the second song title you were asked to complete was Casey Wood Blank with the Strawberry Blonde. Now, what Casey did was dance. Dance. Many of you had other ideas as to what Casey was up to. All of them physically impossible. <laughs> Particularly while dancing a waltz. <laughs> so Victor Sylvester tells me. Besides, the, the next line of the song is, and the band played on. Now, knowing musicians as I do, if Casey had done what you suggested, the band would have stopped playing and joined in. <laughs> Except for Eddie Braden, who's not terribly keen on Mahjong. Smith. <laughs> Now, Armpit Theatre proudly presents episode two of The Three Musketeers. D'Artagnan, christened Alice by a short-sighted clergyman, <laughs> spent his boyhood in Gascony and at the age of 21 came to Paris to seek his fortune, among other things. <laughs> Meeting the musketeers Arthos, 
Porthos and bright shining me. <laughs> D'Artagnan threw in his lot with us and we threw in our lot with him. Oh, what a lot we got! What a lot! What a lot! Yes, all right. Now, we were celebrating our victory over the Cardinal's guards when we were summoned to see the Queen. <laughs> and I are graciously pleased to receive our loyal musketeers. Let me kiss my Aramis. Let me kiss my Porthos. And what is your name? Arthos. Let me... <laughs> Shake you by the hand. handsome youth who stands by your side, so ruddy-faced and tousled hair. I am D'Artagnan. My description wouldn't have fooled anybody. <laughs> oh, why did you send for us, Your Majesty? Your queen is in danger, sob, sob, gulp, gulp. Only you can save me. Now, listen carefully. Here comes the plot. I gave a valuable diamond necklace to my lover, the Duke of Buckingham, but Cardinal Richelieu, my arch enemy, discovered this and persuaded my husband, the king, to throw a ball at which I must wear the necklace or be shamed, discredited and <laughs> humiliated. You must hie to London, recover the jewels, and return them to me here before the 14th. Farewell, and may fortune attend your mission. Brave my Musketeers. Adieu. Adieu. Hey, I add you. We've won the cup. <laughs> to horse. To horse. To goat. To goat. I couldn't afford a horse. <laughs> all through the night, the musketeers rode till rosy-fingered dawn dappled all with pearls of translucent light. <laughs> And the trees wept dewdrops upon the green sward eclept Picardy. <laughs> and the roses shiny blush. Oh, get on with it. <laughs> Stop padding your parts, mate. If he's doing padding. Oh, my well, lot. Right. So that. Four hours later, the road to Calais. Boop! There's a place we can stop for refreshment. Ah, bistro. <laughs> <laughs> Keeper. Ah, good morrow, sire. Uh, where are you bound? After a night riding a goat practically everywhere. <laughs> we are, we're making for Cullis. Well, rub down the horses and milk the goat, then bring us food. Yes, sire. May I suggest a boar's egg surprise? What's the surprise? It's still attached to the rest of the boar. <laughs> And bring us venison and woodcock and ptarmigan and lark's tongues and a shilling bag of chips too. <laughs> and don't spare the vinegar tonight we celebrate. But the innkeeper in the pay of the wicked cardinal hastens to the kitchen to inform his master. Exchange here. Now I want to speak to Cardinal Richelieu. I'm very sorry, sir, but the telephone won't be invented for another 200 years. Will you wait? No, but immediately it's invented. Call me back. <laughs> Blast! Never mind, I'll attach a note to the leg of this pigeon. Now, there. Why don't you fly? Why don't you fly? Well, I think it's because it's casserole. <laughs> oh, yeah, it's casserole. <laughs> yeah. The Cardinal is in Paris. There's only one thing for it. Oi, Cardinal! Hello! Ah. Uh, I've got the three musketeers here. Aye! The three musketeers! What did you say? <laughs> the musketeers down in there. Oh, good. Then they're in my power. Ah! Richelieu, our bête noire. That is your actual black beast. Yeah. <laughs> Evening, bet. Oh, God! Oh. Oh. Ah. Ah. Oh. Ah. Oh. Oh. Name of a dog. Fido. Correct. Double the money. Oh, yes, I don't mind, Huey. All right, now, for 50 sous, how do you make a Maltese cross with four matches? Light them and stick them up his vest. <laughs> <laughs> but seriously, we're still good friends because... Oh, we're riding, riding along, along on the crest of the wave and the world is on. Meanwhile, back at the plot. 
The musketeers are engaged in a fight to the death with the Cardinal's guards. Will they escape? Will they reach the Duke of Buckingham in time? Will Jock and Snowy escape from the jaws of the giant man-eating Cumberland? Where did my snowman go? Will you love me in September as you did in May? Tune in next week for the answer to these and many other questions when we bring you episode three, count them three, how do they do it, of the Three Musketeers. <laughs> And now the Fraser Hayes for Hear No Evil, See No Evil, Speak No Evil, and Marge. <laughs> <laughs> to do a great injustice to It's Only a Paper Moon, ladies and gentlemen, the Fraser Hayes for. Say it's only a paper moon sailing over a cardboard sea. But it wouldn't be make believe if you believed in me. Yes, it's only a canvas sky hanging over a muslin tree. But it wouldn't be make believe if you believed in me. Without your love, it's a hunky tonk parade. Without your love, it's a melody played on a penny arcade. It's a Barnum and Bailey world. Color supplement, the part of the show that can only be heard in color. And here now with news of what's on in London for the discerning visitor, man on the spot, Brad Smallpiece. Well, it's been all oh, go, go, go this week, but fortunately the bland mixer still to be working, so let's have a look at swing in London scene. Well, it's rapper pig me on the knee with a French loaf week in Southwark, and. Uh... <laughs> To celebrate this annual event, there's a torchlit display of Rabbi Tossin by the Civil Defence <laughs> On Tuesday, there's the Intercity's Freestyle Muff Waving Contest at St Ethelbert's and the Harbour Master's Egg Poaching Jamboree at the Lost Property Office, Baker Street. <laughs> but I myself would plump for an exhibition of au pair greasing at Smithfield on Thursday. <laughs> Will Thursday never come? Now, fashion. Celia Twick reports from Paris. What is Pierre Beaumain up to behind the closed doors of his Paris salon? Mind your own business, ducky. <laughs> and ask where you spend your time. Come in here with all those sort of in your <laughs> The British male is becoming more and more closed conscious. The trend has even reached the police force, who we hear are having new with it uniforms designed for them. Over now to the cocktail bar at Bow Street Magistrates Court, where top designers are exhibiting what tomorrow's policemen will be wearing. The parade is described by the fashion correspondents of the Police Gazette, Inspector Tom <laughs> Grutt and Detective Sergeant Obadiah Graspole. Ah, uh, evening all. Ah, uh, yes. Uh, first we see Roger and George chatting at a bar. 
Roger wears the basic little black outfit that no trendy copper on the beat should be without. Gone the cumbersome helmet and in its place a cheeky tomboyish little number in pink velour with a bobble on the top. <laughs> what fun. <laughs> Above the peep-toed, courage boots. White PVC, of course, he wears Bermuda shorts cut daringly low over the hips to reveal just a hint of midriff. <laughs> well done, Roger. You look stunning. <laughs> and uh, George has gone gay in a figure-hugging pastel one-piece cat suit. Yes, how ideal for those interminable peace marches. Gone, the bulky pockets of yesteryear, whistle, notebook and truncheon are now carried in a dinky handbag. <laughs> ah, yes. Look out, Mr Burglar. George is ready for anything. <laughs> for evening wear, Sydney has really gone to town. Notice his non-crushed black velvet matador pants, fastened at the knee with a simple rhinestone buckle. So practical for those drafty rides in a black Mariah. Uh, his frilled shirt, surmounted by a shorty op-art cape in wild silk. Uh, and should it come on to rain? Why, no matter. See, it's reversible. The, uh, the alsation on the lease is optional and can be dyed to match the colour of your hair. But uh, just so that we do not forget that Rover 2 is in the force, his toenails are painted regulation grey. Thank you, Sydney, and stop it, Rover. <laughs> yes, sit, ooh, la, la, and the police force of tomorrow. Carry on, constable. Yes, and if that's the uniform branch, I can't wait to see the plain clothes. <laughs> well, now, this week the Round the Horn colour supplement turns its attention to the sea. One of the most typical traits of your true Englishman is his love of the ocean. Was it not the immortal Shelley who said of the Mediterranean... Roll on, thou mighty... <laughs> I don't think that immortal was quite the right word. History resounds with the names of seafaring Englishmen. Nelson! Kiss me hard. I can't, sir. My lips are chapped. <laughs> Oh, one more chap won't hurt. <laughs> and that was, of course, the famous scene between Nelson Rockefeller and Hardy Amis. <laughs> what stories does the scene not conjure up? Well, West Side Story, the Nun Story, and the story of the Bishop and the Actress. There's just three of the stories the sea doesn't conjure up, but all of us thrill to the romance of smuggling. Ah, uh, what have I got, you say? I'll tell you what I got. A brandy for the person, backy for the clerk. That's what I got. Ah, that's what I got. Ah, <laughs> ah, and bales of fine silk for me ladies' dresses, and perfumes from the Indies, and barrels of rare spices, ah, and kegs of rum, and a fine cockatoo, and a copy of Mariah Monk, purchased, purchased in Paris, a bath sack and diamonds and rubies and a dancing bear. Arr, that's what old Jim's got. Yes, sir. Well, now, would you mind opening the other suitcase, please? <laughs> In times of war, the sea becomes a bastion girt round our tight little island. It says here. <laughs> and perhaps it's for the best. You're terribly vulnerable if your bastions are ungirt. <laughs> How well one remembers those dark wartime days back in the 40s. When we were going to the cinema to see those, there's a U-boat on port bar number one. I've been seven nights without sleep. The convoy must get through. Don't worry about Felicia, sir. I'll look after her. God, what a mess. What a ghastly mess type of film. <laughs> now, here is an excerpt from that great naval epic, In Which We Sink. <laughs> Starring Dame Celia Mole Strangler, an aging juvenile, Binky Huckerback. Charles, Charles, you're back. Yes. <laughs> I'm between ships. I've got a 48. Yes, the chaplain told me. <laughs> it's not long, Charles. Was it, was it rough out there? In the Atlantic? Yes. Pretty rough. Just Noel Card and me against the entire German Navy. <laughs> we, we had a brush with a cue boat at breast. Oh, was it a breast boat at cue? I can't remember. <laughs> oh, I'm tired, so damned tired. I don't know if I can stick it. You've got to, Charles. I can't. 
It seems so pointless. It's not pointless, Charles. We've all got to do it. The Russians are sticking it out in Stalingrad. <laughs> oh, my dear, in 30 degrees of frost. <laughs> But you don't know what it's like out there. Convoy, the officers' quarters were hit by a Stuka. We've been messing with the men for days. How awful for you, Charles. Yes, they're fine chaps, Fiona. From all over England they come. Miners, navvies, bus conductors, common, uncouth little men. But somehow, when they put on uniform and they're fighting for an ideal, they become... Common, uncouth little sailors. <laughs> I'm going back to them. You were right, Fiona. I know, Charles. I know you know, etc., etc., etc. Oh, Charles, how brave you are. Yes, aren't I? <laughs> and handsome. Oh, yes, Charles, yes. Terribly, terribly handsome. And if I don't get back, will you do something for me? Yes, Charles, anything. Well... You remember that little cottage we rented at Tunbridge Wells just before the war? With roses round the door and hydrangeas in the garden. Yes. I want you to go back there. Go back to that place which we shared with so many happy hours. But why, Charles? Why? I think I left the bathwater running. <laughs> What of songs of the sea? Well, who better to sing us a rollicking shanty than rambling Sid Rumpo? Well, practically anybody, I should think, but unfortunately, he's here. Ah, uh, hi, my dearie, and not fast your dando, mate, a whole tight your nadgers. Yes. <laughs> I once did, it gave me chillblains. <laughs> I take it you're going to bend our ears with a nautical ditty? Aye, aye, aye. It is something I picked up in a dockside tavern in Portsmouth. It tells, the, it tells of a mermaid who lures a young sailor lad to his doom with her watery embraces. She be half woman and half fish. Yeah, sounds sort of girl you wouldn't half have fun with. <laughs> <laughs> Precisely. When you've been at sea for days on end, you're not that choosy. <laughs> Tis a sad song and goes after this fashion. <clears throat> Twas on the good ship Habercock, and I a midship might, when four days out of Liverpool a mermaid did I sight. Singing, fare ye well, my Betty O. Fare ye well, I say. Fare ye well, my pretty young maid. My fuddocks be bound away. <laughs> then the mermaid sings to him in wheedling tones. Come, marry me, my pretty lad, and live beneath the billow. A coral reef shall be our bed, an octopus our pillow. <laughs> Singing, fare thee well, my merry o, fare thee well to you. Fare thee well, my pretty young lass, my furrocks be rusted through. <laughs> And seduced by the siren's voice and the fact that he can only see the top half of her sticking up out of the waves, the foolish sailor lad leaps over the side and drowns. And as he goes down for the third time, he sings, Fare thee well, my Sally O, fare thee well, sweetheart. I am no use to you, my love. My fuddocks have come apart. <laughs> well, there he goes, the rollicking, rambling Sid Rumpo. <laughs> and if anyone needs a good rollicking, he does. <laughs> The British are still a nation of seafaring adventurers. 
In the studio with me are, are two such intrepid, grizzled old sea dogs who've only just completed a trip around the world in an open lifeboat. Well, gentlemen, welcome. Oh, hello, I'm Julian. This is my friend Sandy. <laughs> Hello, Mr. Horn. Well, what sent you trolling off around the world like you did? <laughs> oh, it was the call of the sea, Mr. Horn. Yes. The call of the sea. When I get sea. it, I can't resist it. He can't it. resist it. He no. can't. That's that. <laughs> when he gets the call, he's got to go. Oh. He's got to go. He's got to go. you, Jew? Oh, like, like a shot. Like a shot. Like a shot. Like a shot. Time, Horn. Yes. Yeah. Not like a shot. Yes, we was in Southampton. The urge come on us, didn't come it? On us, just yeah. come on us. I said to Jewel, why not? Why not? I said, why not? Didn't I, Jewel? Yes, you did. <laughs> I said that. You did. Yes, I don't tell no lies. Oh. I don't tell no lies. No, he yes. did. It's the truth, Mr. Horn. So I said, well, I'm gay. And he is, Mr. Horn. <laughs> oh. oh, no, ducky. Oh, he's, there's no one gay near. There's no one gay near. No, so, I can say that again. Oh, yes, go on. <laughs> yes, thank you. So we set sail the next day in this lifeboat. What, with no preparations? Oh, I had my hair done. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> oh. Bona Raya. Oh. <laughs> no. <laughs> Buffon, yes. <laughs> go on, Jewel. <laughs> Any road up to cut a long story short. <laughs> After several days at sea, where did we find ourselves? Where did we find ourselves? Where? Where? We well ask. Nowhere. No. <laughs> Nowhere. No. We had no idea where we were. Of course, we had our sea lallies by then. Oh. But, but if I told you what we suffered, you'd <gasps> never believe. <laughs> never. Fourteen days. Fourteen we were days. Fourteen days. Fourteen days. <laughs> Fourteen days. We were exposed. Exposed, exposed, exposed. to the elements. <laughs> yeah. Not a single tin of face cream. Not a single tin. <laughs> well, we nearly cracked, didn't we, Jewel? Oh, yeah. Nervous tension. No, dry skin. <laughs> and then this great storm blew up. Blew right up, it did. Yes. <laughs> right storm. Between him and me. Between him and me. Storm. I thought he'd nick me eyebrow tweezers. Look, yeah. <laughs> did you keep a record of the trip? Oh, cool. Show me an article long. Go on. Show me. <laughs> Nautical long. Yeah. Go on, show him, Jewel. Yeah. Mm. Listen to this. Mm. Eighth day, still no land to be varded anywhere. No land. Rations low. No. Down to our last tins of pate. Pate. Twelfth day, no food, no. sand, raving. I was raving. Oh, <laughs> what? Fourteenth day, I went overboard. Oh, terribly, Mr. Horney did. <laughs> a gale blown at me, hanging onto me jib for dear life. Oh, oh <laughs> spray dashing me eek. Yes. The salt taking me eyelashes. <laughs> it was terrible, Mr. Horn. Suddenly, I become aware Jewel is screaming. The department of no surprise. <laughs> yes. Uh, oh. <laughs> Bold. <laughs> and there he is in the water. In the water. And I shouted, didn't I? I yes. shouted, oh me, overboard! Yeah, what, did, what did you do? There was one, only one thing you could do in a predicament like that. I fainted. fainted. <laughs> dead away. I summoned up my last resources, stiffened up my sinews. Well, they do go limp in the water. <laughs> but, but did you manage to... <laughs> but did you manage to drag yourself up on deck? Oh, no, we dressed quite casual. <laughs> like uh, sweaters and jeans and... Oh, I see what you mean! Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Uh, well, I got back on board more dead than alive. More dead than alive, but I resuscitated oh. him, oh, didn't yes, I? Yes. I gave him artificial resuscitation. Yes. Mind you, it's not like the real thing. It's more of the... <laughs> it's more of the kiss of death when he does it. <laughs> but listen to this from the log. 25th day, dear diary, Sands in one of his moods again. I think he's going to pieces. He started to wander, didn't you, Sands? Yes, started... I wandered, I wandered, mm. didn't I? I don't like to talk about it, Mr. Horn. I don't like to talk about it. It was terrible. I was babbling, wasn't I, Jewel? Babbling. Babbling, babbling. Oh, babbling. He was babbling a green fields, he was. Yes. An earl's court. Yes. Mm. <laughs> and she was rolling and pitching. Well, the boat. yes, the boat. We were shipping it green over the bows. And our gunnels were a wash, weren't they, Jewel? A wash! And I do hate washy gunnels. Yes. <laughs> then on the 60th day, we was picked up by picked the Purser. Picked up with a purser. Mm. Purser? I thought you were in a lifeboat. Well, we was, but it was strapped to the deck of the Queen Mary. <laughs> and it's men like that that made Britain what she is today. Well, that's the end of the show, except for the Riddle Marie. Here it is. My first part is inflatable and squeaks. My second part is 17 inches long and translucent. My third part hums, 
And the sum of my parts is covered in ginger fluff and freckled. What is it? You see, there's one lying on my hall mat and I'm not, not going to pick it up till I know what it is. <laughs> Cheerio, see you next week. That was Round the Horn, starring Kenneth Horn with Kenneth Williams, Hugh Paddock, Betty Marsden and Bill Pertwee. On the musical side, you heard the Fraser Hayes Four and Edwin Braden and the Hornblowers. The script was written by Barry Chalk and Marty Feldman, and the show is produced by John Simmons. Here is a warning to all shipping. It's round the horn. And tonight, Kenneth's guest are... The Reverend Unseemly Dog Posture, conducting the mass pumas of the Women's Institute, Ed Boston. <laughs> and Dame Sweeney Egg Blast, the Clacton Dripping Heiress. <laughs> and here's your host, Cardiff's dusky Queen of Song, Kenneth Hall. <laughs> Thank you. That was, of course, Douglas Smith, who would like to get it straight. <laughs> but unfortunately, it has to stay in plaster for another two weeks. <laughs> Here now are the answers to last week's questions. First, the where do you find it in Scotland question. And the answers were hanging down in front of the kilt, tucked... <laughs> tucked under the arm and blown <laughs> and stuffed down the sock <laughs> set on Burns night when it's used to cut the haggis <laughs> finally the where would you find it written question and the answers were on the base of the Great Pyramid halfway along the Great Wall of China in whitewash and in a tobacconist window in the Edgware Road <laughs> at least that's where I read it and if you're listening Miss Lolita I rang and rang, but there was no answer. <laughs> so I've joined the Photographic Society of the Chalk Farm Polytechnic instead. At this point, we were going to do The Three Musketeers, Episode 3. But we got fed up with it. <laughs> so here instead is a thrilling story of Africa. Proudly present Kenneth Horn as Lip Harvest of the River. My name is Dr. Gandamol Lip Harvest the Third. The other two died of embarrassment. <laughs> I was christened. I was christened James Obidah, St. John Abraham, Spike Loomis, Cyril Angus, Ali Ben Moses, Rastus Petty, Heinrich Giovanni, Fuman Roger after my father. <laughs> my mother wasn't too sure. Apparently he kept his... <laughs> Apparently he kept his hat on throughout their brief acquaintance. However... <laughs> However, dear reader, I digress. I am a keen botanist... Yes, we've all got your number. <laughs> ...and zoologist. In the spring of 1883, I was in the Umpopo country looking for the great white rhino which I had sent up the road for the newspaper and which had never come back. <laughs> One evening I was in the bar of Dutch Pete's waterfront dive having a sundown and when a strange figure lurched in, I crossed to him and, smiling politely, asked him if he fancied a jigger. No thanks, I never dance with strange men. <laughs> but, I, but I have a drink. I need one. My name is Gaylord Fafitch. What I have done, no white man has done and lived. I've been up the umpopo with yellow, with yellow jack. How is he? Not so bad, considering. Thank <laughs> you, regards. Thank you. 
I have seen things up there that would make you blanch. Well, how's Blanche? <laughs> oh, she's fine. Yes. Same as Jello Jack, only whiter. <laughs> yes, uh, I have seen the lost city of the water lumber. Water lumber. <laughs> oh, yes. The fabled lost jungle city that ruled over by a white woman known by the superstitious natives as she. Who is she? The cat's mother. <laughs> they say she's over 300 years old, but as beautiful as she was when she was 250. Well, I must meet her. Why? Well, I'm attracted to older women, you see. Will you lead me to her? It's a dangerous journey through fever-ridden swamp, through trackless jungle of the mountains, across deserts, through crocodile-infested rivers. Is there no other way? Well, there's 73 bath passes. <laughs> well, I haven't got any small change, and you know these conductors. They'll never take a note. Then we must go by river. We'll sail at dawn tomorrow. The next morning we set off in the African Queen, played by Douglas Smith with cocoa on his face. <laughs> he nosed his way lazily upstream. For Fitch and I relaxed in the s, -s, -s dern <laughs> Chug, 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 fut, fut, fut. <laughs> Fut, fut, Smith. <laughs> yes, sir, it's the engine. Well, give the old boiler a kick. Yes, sir. Ah! <laughs> Thank you, sir. When you're an old boiler like me, you don't get many kicks. <laughs> Isn't that the one who played Granny in The Three Musketeers? <laughs> yeah, she gets around a bit for an old one. <laughs> Meanwhile, halfway up the Ompopo. Fut fut, chug chug. <laughs> Kafong. Smith, what, what, what was that supposed to be? Well, I think a crocodile has fouled the propeller, sir. What shall I do? Hit it on the nose with a rolled-up newspaper. <laughs> From here on, we'll have to go by foot. Follow me. <laughs> I think we should have moored the boat first. Help! Help! I can't swim! Well, tread water! I can't! The crocodile's gnawing my leg! Well, hop water, then! <laughs> We scrambled ashore more dead than alive and set off on foot through the tangled undergrowth of the Umpopo country. For Fitch and I made slow progress. Well, it's not easy to walk when you've got a crocodile hanging onto your leg. <laughs> <laughs> can't go on. I'm done for. Oh, come on, for Fitch. Uh, uh, oh, no, I'm fi f f finished. <laughs> he was bent double with agony. <laughs> Suddenly there was a st and a ft. <laughs> for a moment I thought he'd expired. <laughs> but fortunately he was only transfixed by a poison dart. <laughs> Where did the dart hit you, for Fitch? Well, if I was a dartboard, it'd be triple 19. <laughs> then, then suddenly from out of the bush, or rather from under the bush, came the tiny naked figure of a man riding a hedgehog. <laughs> he was 30 inches high and he brandished a small but deadly blowpipe. He galloped across the clearing, reined his hedgehog to a halt and dismounted with a sigh of relief. <laughs> I have a warning for you, white man. What is it? Never ride a hedgehog with no clothes on. <laughs> Who are you? I'm Sunny Zal, king of the Mpopo pygmies. Observe, tiny but perfect in every detail. <laughs> What brings you here? We are looking for the lost city of the water lumber and the white goddess, she. Oh, uh... ah! <laughs> but you are injured. You need a doctor. I'll summon my tribe. 
George, Arthur, Sidney, Solly. Hundreds of tiny figures swarmed out of the undergrowth, and in a trice we were up to our knees in Umpopo. <laughs> But this man is injured, he can't walk. Don't worry, I'll give him a pick-me back. That night found us in Sconston, a rude hut, for which was raving. Ah, I've got f -f fever. Your friend delirious, but which doctor will soon cure him? Where is he? At which surgery? He's coping with epidemic among pygmy tribe, German measle. Measle? You mean measles? No, pygmy so small, only room for one. <laughs> Ah, water! Water! Here you are, old chap. It's not for me, it's for the crocodile. Ah, <laughs> oh, ah, mother! Oh, thank heavens he recognises me. <laughs> I, I can't, I can't feel me legs. Help me! Help him to feel his legs when he was up there. <laughs> I'm going, I'm going. It's slipping away. It's coming back. It's going again. Oh, I wish it would make its mind up. <laughs> At that moment, the witch doctor arrived. He stood framed in the doorway, towering over three feet tall, a giant of a man for a pygmy. His ears were pierced with elephant tusks. He wore a headdress of fine ostrich plumes, and he carried a matching handbag. <laughs> From his waist dangled his curious medicaments. He spoke. <laughs> what was that? I said, and how's the patient today? Oh, will you examine him? Oh, certainly. Now, does it hurt when I do this? Well, his reflexes are all right. Uh -huh. yeah, now, what do you diagnose? Uh, not one at all. Patient has a bad case of galloping. Galloping what? Don't know. It goes too fast. <laughs> I, uh, I suspect Betty Betty. Betty Betty, is that bad? Not Betty Betty bad, not Betty Betty good, so so. And how are you going to treat it? <laughs> As follows First, I smear myself in sacred chicken fat. Then I make Kabbalistic sign. Well, there's nothing Kabbalistic. <laughs> nothing Kabbalistic about that sign. <laughs> Then I summon Devil Drummer. Devil Drummer! Yes, baby. <laughs> Give me a steady four and easy on the hi hat. A one, a two, a one, two, three, four. <laughs> uh, one more time. <laughs> about the room, brandishing a chicken above his head. For Fitch stirred, his eyes opened, he slowly sat up, and then, as if possessed by evil spirits, he screamed. Shut up! Have a bit of consideration. I'm not well. Next morning, we set off again in search of the lost city and a she. For days, we hacked our way through the undergrowth until finally, there in a valley below us, lay the fabled city of Watalumba. Its marble domes and gabled minarets glinting in the sunlight. I heard a movement behind us and turned to see four grinning dark faces. The leader spoke. Ah, white man, we were expecting you. Would you accompany us? Delighted. <laughs> and then mercifully came oblivion. <laughs> When we came to, for Fitch and I found ourselves lying on the marble floor of an enormous chamber. At the far end of the room was an ornate throne on which sat the 300-year-old white goddess played by Betty Marsden without any artificial aid. <laughs> on either side of her stood a huge Nubian. As if in answer to my thoughts, for Fitch spoke. Ah, oh, what an enormous pair of Nubians! <laughs> That which is not shall be, for I am that which has always been, and what I have done, I have done many, many times. <laughs> I am she, but you can call me Lil. <laughs> she, I am old. Three hundred years have I lived. 
But with age, there are compensations. I can get in up the pictures free on Thursday. <laughs> I am old. I am wrinkled. I am hideous. But... But what? Don't rush me, I'm thinking. <laughs> there must be something. Ah, yes. I am powerful. My whim is law. One of you shall be my lover. The other shall be thrown to the sacred shark. Which is it to be? Me or the man-eating shark? Well, don't rush me. I'm thinking. <laughs> See this pool beneath the throne? There waits... <laughs> Sacred shark played by Douglas Smith with teeth cut out of orange peel. My little pet is hungry. Snap, snap. <laughs> well played, Smith. Thank you, sir. I also do sheep. All right. <laughs> well, gentlemen, uh, have you decided? Well, for fitch. Well, worldly popish. Seems there's no choice. Last one ends a sissy. <laughs> Funny, they all do that. <laughs> and what a way to go, to perish in the awful gaping jaws of the sacred Douglas Smith. And talking of awful gaping jaws, here the sacred Fraser Hayes for to sing... <laughs> which freely translated means serenata. Ladies and gentlemen, the Fraser Hayes for. <laughs> Serenata for me Sing her your song Love's melody So near Yet we're so far apart Here I stand Till I have won her heart Go to my loved one Serenata Say when you're in love, love finds a way. Supplement. And this is the section of the show which you can pull out and if you don't like it, throw it away. 
My first show business here now interviewing a well-known personality at London Airport is that Sunday night person, Seamus Android, whose very name is a synonym for... Deep sleep. <laughs> Come in, Seamus Android. All right. Now, uh, here I am at uh, London Airport, personally, myself in person, to meet someone who I know you will, as I have. So without further ado... <laughs> here is a world-famous personality who I'm going to meet as much as you are, and who is going to meet you as much as you are, and indeed, I am. <laughs> All right. So, so here, without further ado, is the one and only... Oh, he's gone. <laughs> and with that, I return you to the studio. And thank you, Seamus. I won't miss your TV show this week. What you don't see, you don't miss. Now. <laughs> Now, this week, the Colour Supplement special feature is devoted to the Englishman and art. Throughout history, the English have been connoisseurs of the arts. Come in, Gregory. Most uh, kind. Yes, yes. <laughs> There's something I've just acquired, and I'd like your opinion on it. In here, look next to the dagger. Good uh, heavens, a constable. Yes. <laughs> uh, genuine, do you think? Let me see. Mm -hmm. uh, lovely. 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 No doubt about it. It's a genuine constable. Absolutely lovely. Oh, thank you, sir. I do try to keep myself nice. Love of the arts is deeply embedded in the Englishman's soul, and many films have been made depicting the inner struggles and romantic agony of the painter. Here now is an excerpt from that great film of the 40s, The Moon and Sixpence Reduced to Fourpence This Week Only. <laughs> Starring Dame Celia Mole Strangler and aging juvenile Binky Huckaback. Can I come in, Charles? Yes, Fiona. <laughs> I'm glad you've come. It's finished. Oh, Charles. Charles. I think you've captured it. It's a small masterpiece. <laughs> oh, it's not everybody's cup of tea, but I, I like it. Thank you, Phil. <laughs> I mean, you wouldn't see anything like this hanging in the Royal Academy. <laughs> but I don't want it hanging there. <laughs> But, Charles, I'm not quite sure that I, I understand what you're doing. Oh. Surely it's... Surely it's simple enough. Oh. For you, Charles, for you. You're an artist. You painted it. I'm only a woman. Yeah. What does it mean? What it says. Gents wash and brush up. <laughs> the agony of the artist, and uh, here is an artist who's been responsible for more agony than almost anybody alive. Rambling Sid Rumpo. Ah, oh, hello, me dearie. Oh, sing Bogle Titwillow and Lackaday for the fly be on the term. Yes, but now you're a great exponent of the art of folk singing. Now, what are you going to give us this week? Well, it is a taddle groper's dance oh. sung by the villagers of Musgrove Parver, and it heralds the coming of the Oak Apple Fairy, or Sanitary Inspector, <laughs> as he is known in they parts. The Taddle gropers grope around while the turve maiden merrily whirdles her splod. <laughs> and they, they dance to a round delay that goes after this fashion. <clears throat> There's cord wangles in me, pass it back. What shall I do, my Mary O? And I can't woggle my artifacts. <laughs> What shall I do, my darling? <laughs> so the turf maiden sings back. <clears throat> Stove it with a gander hook, that's what you do, my Billy-o. Then you can wobble your artifacts 
as good as new, my darling. So he stoves it with a gander hook, but it don't do no good as he's forgot to put antifreeze in. <laughs> So plaintively, he sings to her. I stoved it in with a gander hook. That's what I done, my Mary O. But now I've nudged me artifacts. What shall I do, my darling? And so she tells him what to do with his artifacts. <laughs> and, and he does it. And... <laughs> And then they dance off, woggling and groping their tattles to the following, to the following refrain. <clears throat> Billy Cocko, me Billy Cocko, who will nadger me dander? Boggle me loomer, me jolly boys, and posit me splee in the morning. <laughs> Thank you, Rambling Sid. I can find the words to express my feelings. <laughs> They're in the script of Till Death Us Do Part. <laughs> well, now, art is subject to changes of fashion, and the current vogue is for Victoriana, old uniforms, and so on. Last week, I paid a visit to a shop near the Portobello Road, and the sign over the door read, Bona Antiques. <laughs> I entered gingerly. Hello. <laughs> Hello, anybody there? Hello, I'm Julian. This is my friend Sandy. Oh, hello, Miss Rose. Oh, hello. Oh, it's nice to see you. Oh, it's lovely to see you. Oh, you can't have a browse through our bric a brac. <laughs> you want it, we've got it. <laughs> yeah. Don't see it, just ask for it. Yes. Do you have anything in mind, Mr. Horn? Oh, I see your eye in that piece in the corner. It's beautiful, isn't it, Jewel? Beautiful, beautiful, beautiful it is. Thing of beauty, that is. It's a wangy rocker. <laughs> well, I don't rock my own wangies. I have a little woman around the corner who does it for me. Oh, bold. <laughs> oh, do they get the cheeky they are? Oh, <laughs> Jewel, change the subject. Yes. <laughs> Yeah, I've got it. What about here? Uniforms. Oh, yes. Uniforms. Very in, very sheesh. Mm, very sheesh. Uniforms. Very. I mean, they're, they're sheeshist. 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 <laughs> Fantabulosa. <laughs> uniforms are in. They're the utmost. Yes, yes, yes. I've heard that wearing old uniforms is the latest craze. Mm, and we've got the craziest utmost. Mm. Good heavens. Good heavens. Soldiers' uniforms. Sailors' uniforms. Look, how do you fancy yourself as a gay hussar? Oh, we take a lovely hussar. Oh. Lovely hussar. With great bullion epaulets yes. and all the frogging down his lallies. Oh, <laughs> um, all of this, look, what about a fireman's uniform? Mm. Very butch. Very butch. Yes. Mm. Comes complete with 14 yards of hosepipe and a dinky little chopper. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Very lovely, that is. Yes, I'm sure. I'm sure it is, but. Lovely. You know, I, I somehow I can't see myself wearing that to the Junior Carlton Club. Unless, of course, it was on fire. No, perhaps you've got a point, perhaps you've got a point. How about a naval uniform? Naval uniform? Well, do you think it's me? Oh, oh do you think it's him, Jules? It is him! It's him, isn't it? Him, yes. Yes. Naval uniform just does something for you. Yeah, just slip it on. Right. Yeah. Yeah, oh. 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 Fantabulous. Oh, oh. Well, uh, I'll take it then. In fact, I'll wear it now. Oh, lovely. Ta-ta, then we'll send you the account. Well, yeah, there he goes. Doesn't he look an absolutely perfect example mm. of a... Oh, what is the phrase, Jewel? Great steaming nip. Oh, very <laughs> yeah. And in my second-hand naval uniform, I got many admiring glances, several compliments. I also got arrested for impersonating a Wren officer. <laughs> How was I to know? I was in the RAF. <laughs> Cheerio, see you next week. That was Round the Horn, starring Kenneth Horn, with Kenneth Williams, Hugh Paddock, Betty Marsden and Bill Pertwee. On the musical side, you heard the Fraser Hayes Four and Edwin Braden on the Hornblowers. The script was written by Barry Chalk and Marty Feldman, and the show is produced by John Simmons.
And tonight, it's the Franz Kafka Banjo. <laughs> Franz's guests are Bishop Podgast with Solid the Exploding Hedgehog, King Freddy of Buganda and the Dreamers, Yaroslav Brovnik, the dog tooth chick. There'll be a tune or two from Werner von Braun and his band of renown. And a romantic interlude with Miss Ecstasy La Bootstrap in the forbidden, in the forbidden dance of the giant flu brush. <laughs> Once seen, never forgotten. Your comment for this evening is that zesty, curvaceous little arm for Mouty Tongue, <laughs> or as he's better known to the Chislehurst police, Kenneth Hall. <laughs> Welcome to the, uh, in spite of any rumours to the contrary, show. <laughs> now, uh, last week the Palpero Poultry Breeders Gazette devoted its fourth leader to a scurrilous attack on Round the Horn, saying that on one occasion in the past what might be construed as a heavily disguised double entendre was allowed to insinuate itself into the scripts. Well, naturally, this came as a shock to me. <laughs> As if I'd ever been aware of such a double entendre, I would have whipped it out immediately or blue penciled it. <laughs> now. <laughs> the phrase that the Pompero Gazette complained of was futterknaggering. <laughs> well, I mean, surely every schoolboy knows what futterknaggering is, and in fact, I believe you can get a badge in the Scouts for it. <laughs> It uh, de derives from the old German. Was it not Goethe who said, Das Futterk ist Nagerein? <laughs> well, no, it wasn't. <laughs> but the word has a long and honourable ancestry and refers to agricultural implements. Now, we went to know that Futterk Nagering has quite a different meaning in Polpero, where, in fact, there's been an outbreak of it recently in the municipal car park. <laughs> and police wish to interview a man in a fawn raincoat. My word, that chap gets about in the form <laughs> ring. Ah, <laughs> uh, he must have a bicycle, I suppose. Still, <laughs> on with the show. Smith, here. Come along. Nothing, sir. I'm yeah. just taking off my phone rain kit. Oh. <laughs> well, remove your cycle clips and announce the next item. Yes, sir. And now. Armpit Theatre presents an action-packed story of mobsters and their morals in the Chicago of the Roaring Twenties. Here then is Little Caesar, or how the bulletproof vest was won. My name is Winthrop D. Rocker. The fella disappeared shortly after I was born. <laughs> Well, you can't blame him, really, can you? And I was brought up by my mother on the wrong side of the tracks, the chipping Sodbury side, <laughs> which explains my accent. I was sent to Yale by my guardian, who was a judge. <laughs> In 1925, I set up a small law practice on the lower east side of Chicago, named after the song of the same name. And after practicing on the east side, I practiced on the west side, and then I had a practice in the middle. And that was when I first heard of Babyface Omipalone. <laughs> Soon to become public enemy number one. Oh, that's for me. I'm the Babyface that Omipalone is talking about. <laughs> my parents were of Italian stock and as a little bambino, I helped my papa in his business. He had an ice cream car on the east side. <laughs> Cream, okey pokey ice the cream. You're lucky to buy some ice cream. Stop me and try some okey pokey. Ah, I don't know Luigi. Ah, the priest, uh, old father, a hooligan. <laughs> it's a hot day, father. Have some ice cream. Oh, I'll have, I'll have a cassata. Uh, coming up. <laughs> hey, bambino. Yes, Papa? Send up one cassata bolognese with a side order of spaghetti. Yes. <laughs> 153 with the 24 coming up. Uh, why do you make your boy work down there in the ice cream cart? Well, keep him off the street. Oh. <laughs> but it's not good for a boy to be in an ice cream cart all day. It's better than in the winter. I sell roast chestnuts. 
His mama has big ideas. She want him to be a gangster. Oh, that's no good being a gangster. Every day they're getting shot down on the steps of the church. Last week we had James Cagney three times. <laughs> What can I do? The boy's got his heart set on being a killer, and after all, it's a regular work. Well, I, I'm school now. I've got an appointment with George Raft at three. He's, he's going to die in my arms. Oh, top of the morning to you. It's been lovely to you. Ciao, Master. Can I come out now, Fafa? My knickerbocker glory is frozen. <laughs> she can come out too and the rest of the bambi come on papa are we got to find somewhere else to live this cart is too small for us <laughs> oh, don't worry mama one day i'll be rich and then i'll buy you a great big ice cream car oh how are you gonna get rich oh, i'm gonna pull a stick up mama papa lend me five dollars i want to buy a gun five dollars don't give the boy the money oh how can he pull a stick up without a gun all right all right all right here's the money that only leaves me two dollars in the world oh thank you papa I see you got it again. Yes, Papa. Yes. Papa? Yes. There's a stick up, hand over the two dollars. <laughs> From then on, Babyface travelled fast. Hardly a week passed without some new exploit. This is a stick-up. Oh, it's Babyface on my Polony. And he's got a machine gun. It's no use holding us up. This is only a sub post up here. That's all right. It's only a sub-machine gun. <laughs> News of Babyface's exploits soon reached Scarface Malone, public enemy number two, and rapidly climbing the charts. Uh, I don't like it, see. I don't like it at all, see. No, there's, there's only room for one Mr. Bigger on here, and that's me, see. Got that fat lip, Karlowski? Got it, puppy, darling heart. Ah, uh, open up, fat lip. Come in, baby face. You wanted to see me, yeah. Malone? Yeah, yeah. Sharky? Yes, boss, what do you want? You know what to do. You want me to rough him up a little? Yeah. Oh, 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 no, 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 don't, don't. I've just combed it. <laughs> oh, no. That's just a sample. Now button your lip. Zip up your nose and beat it. Not so fast. Oh, he's got a gun. It's a sawn off Dusty Springfield. <laughs> and I'm not afraid to use it. <laughs> Drop that Dusty Springfield. I've got a Shirley Bassey 45 here. <gasps> you wouldn't dare. Oh, wouldn't I? <laughs> Evening, all. <laughs> Babyface, Omi Polone, are you going to give yourself up? I think I'm better. I'm a nasty habit. <laughs> and so, Babyface, Omi Polone was brought to trial, and as an old friend of the family, I was called in to defend him. The Supreme Court is now in session. Judge Filibuster presiding. Hey, gentlemen, be seated. What is the charge? The state will prove that Babyface Omi Pallone did willfully shoot 23 people in cold blood. A town in Kansas. <laughs> uh, with this 45 bore Dusty Springfield record. Uh, what have you to say in your defense? I was only in bed at the time. Your Honor, the slayings took place over a period of eight years. I'm every sleeper. I object. I object on behalf of my client. I wish to stand behind the Fifth Amendment. Why? My trousers are coming down. <laughs> Read all about it, Army Pallone, trial, third day, jury out. And the jury were out for 12 hours. We finally left a message with the woman in the sweet shop next door. <laughs> and at last, they filed back into the jury box. <laughs> 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 
Members of the jury, have you reached your verdict? Well, we've considered his record and we've decided to vote it a... <coughs> have you anything to say before I pass sentence? Yes. Don't send me up the river. I don't want to be sent up. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> now listen, I'm only a kid. I'm a victim of society, brought up in a tenement ice cream cart. All day squatting on a block of ice. No wonder I'm a dead end kid. <laughs> yes. All right, yes. I'm a pretty thief. The word is petty. <laughs> <laughs> Who's making this speech? <laughs> she. I was just underway then. Yeah, I was getting going. Yes, I'm a thief, a gunman, a bank robber, and me library books overdue. <laughs> but I don't care. Okay, I'm guilty. But you're all guilty. Is it a sin? Is it a crime? For loving you, dear, like I do. All together. It is a crime. And they sent him to the penitentiary where they gave him the chair. And a reading lamp and a chintz three-piece suite. <laughs> While we're on the subject of public enemies, here are the Fraser Hayes Ford to sing She Loves Me and Please Say That Foul Play Cannot Be Ruled Out. Ladies and gentlemen, the Fraser Hayes Ford. <laughs> Supplement. First cookery, great classic recipes by Daphne Whitethigh. <laughs> Whenever I give a small informal dinner party, I always serve mousse stroganoff. It's simple and it's quite, quite easy to prepare. First, take your mousse and truss it for the oven. <laughs> Four hours at a regular six. 
Garn ye with a sprig of parsley, put an orange in its mouth, and stuff it with sage and onions or garlic patty. One tip, before you stuff it, make sure it's dead. Ah, lovely. That really made my eyes water. Now, this week the colour supplement turns its attention to the Englishman in love. Yes, the Englishman is often considered to be frigid in matters of the heart. Darling, I love you. Kiss me. No, no, Roger. Not before the servants. I'm sorry. After you, Mellors. <laughs> oh, oh, thank you, Your Ladyship. I love you. Kiss me. Come no. on, you. Oh, you're lovely. <laughs> Lady Chatterley's lover can be seen later tonight in Gardening Club. <laughs> when he'll be showing you some unusual ways of using your rockery. <laughs> Nowadays, love is hard to define. It means different things to different people. We, we took our microphone out into the street and asked passers-by the question, how do you feel about love? And here are some of their replies. No, thank you. Not today. <laughs> Is it those peppermint things? <laughs> I can't tell it from butter. <laughs> uh, not when I'm on duty. <laughs> but it's very civil of you to inquire. They say money can't buy you love. But every week the Sunday papers are full of stories of people who seem to have done just that. Come in. Uh, are you the editor of the Sunday Blast? The, the, the paper that rips the lid off? Yes, yes I am. Uh, well, my name is J.P.'s Mould Gruntfattock. <laughs> would, would you like to rip my lid off? Well, how do you mean exactly? Uh, you can expose me for £20,000. <laughs> yes. I, yeah, I'm a twilight person, and I'm offering you my story. Yes, now, what is your story? It's about how I left my wife and 14 kids in a slum caravan in Romford to live a life of sin with a scarlet woman in Ponder's End. <laughs> of how I give midnight nudie bathing parties from my private yacht, moored to the millionaire's playground of Grimsby. <laughs> It's the story. It's the story of how I bought forbidden love and paid the price. There, will you buy it? Well, yes, it seems worth twenty thousand pounds. Now, when did all this happen? It hasn't yet. <laughs> but if you give me the money, I'm willing to start tomorrow. <laughs> Love is where you find it, providing, of course, you know where to look. And what can start as a casual friendship can blossom into a great romance, given the right location. For instance, on a boat. Hey! Oh, Charles. You startled me, creeping up on me like that. Did I, Fiona? <laughs> yes. You gave me a turn. <laughs> Did I? Oh, it must be my turn next. <laughs> it's just taking a little stroll. It's terribly man romantic, isn't it? The moonlight glinting on the water. Look, Fiona, up there, it's vast, almost frighteningly vast, and dark. I wonder if there's intelligent life up there. Up there, Charles? Not up my nose. <laughs> up there, Fiona. The sky. All those stars, they're, they're shining just for us. See them reflected in the water. There the plough, there Orion's belt, and just below it, Orion's trousers. <laughs> there what seems to be the bear, and there what looks like a dead moggy. 
Oh, it is, Charles. Oh, I feel they're all there, just for us. With the exception of the dead Moggy, of course. Good. Love is so many things, Fiona. It's wanting and needing and feeling and searching and losing and finding, hoping and dreading and wanting to need and needing to want. And Don't need. speak, Charles. Not for a moment. Why not? I want to get a word in. <laughs> oh, I love you, Charles. Breathlessly, hopelessly, tenderly, despairingly, longingly, meltingly. It's a wordless love, Charles. <laughs> We're both lost, Fiona. Lost in each other's arms, fumbling in the dark. <laughs> fumbling for the right words. Oh, Fiona, kiss me. Oh, not here, Charles. People will see. I don't care about people. All right, come in, number 13. Your time's up. <laughs> the park's closing in five minutes. Come along, Fiona. You paddle, I'll steer. <laughs> and the part of the dead Moggy was played by members of the BBC Repertory Company. <laughs> Songs have been written about love from time immemorial, and if music be the food of love, here now is the syrup of figs. <laughs> Rambling Sid Rumper. Oh, hello, me dearie oh, for, for green grows the grunge on my lady's posset. <laughs> for, she's, for she's off with the raggle-taggle window cleaner O. Oh. Now, what have you for us in your gander bag this week? It is a Lummockshire air sung by the old spume pickers of thy parts as they sit in the chimney corner scroping their cord wangles. <laughs> While they don't get ITV in them parts. <laughs> and they have to make their own fun. Yeah. Well, perhaps it's just as well. I mean, scroping their cord wangles and watching <laughs> Huey Green would be rather sort of bread and bread, wouldn't it? <laughs> Precisely. Yeah. Mm. <laughs> and so to the song. When I was a young man, I nadgered on my splod. <laughs> As I nurked at the woggler's trade. When suddenly I thought while trussing up my groats. <laughs> I'd wordle with a fair young maid. We wordled through the summer time until the winter came. And the only, only thing that I ever did wrong was to tell her my foggy, foggy name. <laughs> now I'm married and I've put away my splod. And my son's at the Woggler's trade. Though I still think, as I'm trussing up my groats, of wordling with a fair young maid, I'd wordle her in the winter time. I'd wordle her for dear life. But the only, only thing that I'd have to do is to keep it from the foggy, foggy wife. <laughs> oh. And I think there's a moral for us all there, you know. Never wordle in your own backyard. <laughs> Especially if the neighbours are watching. Well, people used to say that matches were made in heaven. Or was it Sweden? It, it matches not. <laughs> Nowadays, they're more likely to be made by computer, and a firm has recently opened called Boner Soulmates, who offered to do it electronically. <laughs> and I decided to pay them a visit. Hello, anybody there? Oh, hello, I'm Julian. This is my friend Sandy. Hello, yes. Hello, Mr. Or. We are bonus soulmates. 
Our motto is, for every Omi, there's a Pallone. <laughs> yes, we guarantee to match you with a perfect partner. A sort of marriage bureau. What we actually do to find you the perfect partner yes. is we, we fill in your particulars. Mm. <laughs> fill first, in, you uh, think? Yes. Well, first, we've got to get your essential data. Would you mind answering a few questions? No, I don't mind. They've all worked out these questions by a psychiatrist yes. to determine your personality. Yes, yes. Now, uh, first, well, what sort of car do you drive? Well, what's that got to do with it? Oh, well, you see, a car is a sort of virility symbol. You have the sort of car that you drive indicates the sort of person that you are. Oh. For instance, Sean Connery drives a great big powerful sports car. Very butch, very potent. Yes. <laughs> very butch. Right, well, what do you drive? A mini. <laughs> Conversion. <laughs> yes. You get the idea, don't you, Mr. Orr? <laughs> yes, well, um... I have a vintage model. <laughs> but it hasn't gone for years. I think that tells us all we need to know. <laughs> Now, uh, next, uh, sexual attraction quotient. Uh, we mark you out of ten. Yes. yes. Uh, Richard Burton's nine and a half. At least. And I suppose Fellini's eight and a half. <laughs> <laughs> How would you mark his SIQ out of ten, Jewel? Well, now, let's see. Uh... Oh, let's give him the benefit of the doubt. Minus four. We're not very prompt. <laughs> Still, put his, punch, put his punch card in the computer yes. and see what happens. All right. Put there it in. Goes. There it goes. There it goes. Oh, look at that going away Come there. Come on, girl. Have a vada at that computer, Mr. Orne. Uh, Have a vada, yes. Got a basin full for your eyes. Looking at that lot, eh? Look, that's digesting all your information. Pretty, you see, in a moment, it? out will pop out the card that will have on it the name of your ideal mate. Yes. Oh, there it goes. Go in, girl. Go on. Go in. <laughs> oh! Oof! There, Mr. Horn. What, it, what does it say? Well, we haven't got all the bugs out of the machine yet. No, no, know. no, but what's on the car? Well, the computer is occasionally subject to error. Well, I hope you're going to be very happy together. Yeah, but what's the name of my ideal soulmate? Who is it? Well, it says here, Edwin Braden. <laughs> Great airy thing. <laughs> well, Eddie and I discussed the matter and we decided it wouldn't work out. Besides, he's already promised to his lead trombonist. <laughs> a Miss Evadne Hotlips codpiece. And I'm not going to stand in their way. All for that. <laughs> Or for that matter, anywhere within a radius of five miles. <laughs> so I shall go to their wedding as long as I don't have to kiss the bride. Cheerio, see you next week. That was Round the Horn, starring Kenneth Horn with Kenneth Williams, Hugh Paddock, Betty Marsden and Bill Pertwee. On the musical side, you heard The Fraser Hayes Four and Edwin Braden and the Hornblowers. The script was written by Barry Talk and Marty Feldman, and the show is produced by John Simmons. My lords, ladies, gentlemen, <laughs> your referee for the contest, Kenneth. Man Mountain! Ho! Ooh. The MC was, of course, Hugh Paddock, the wrestling vicar of St. Barnabas without. <laughs> well. All right, Smith. Make the announcement. Yes, sir. But first, a oh. word from our sponsor. Oh. Is your horse a wallflower at dances? Does he stand in the corner alone? Persuade his best friend to whisper in his ear, U-F-O. <laughs> Under fetlock odour. Smith. <laughs> Buy him some dobby mist, the horse deodorant that nine out of ten Hollywood stars prefer. Smith, have you got the mania again? No, sir, I've been got at. Oh. Offered money to plug the product. Oh. You see, I'm only paid a pittance for announcing. I'm feeling the pinch. Look, Oga, I'm sorry. I had no idea. 
Here's something to get on with. Oh, thank you, sir. A pair of steps. <laughs> and now, Armpit Theatre presents a tale of the gay bohemian life of Paris in the 80s. Trilby! My name is William Mandergast, known as Little Billy, for reasons I don't care to go into. <laughs> I am, uh, I'm a painter, and in the year 1880, I came to Paris to pursue my bent. <laughs> ah, the Montmartre of the 80s, a hotbed of talent. There was the sculptor Rodin. I chip, a, I chip away a little here. I chip away a little there, a little more here, and voila, you can see right through into the bedroom next door. <laughs> it's magnificent, the lovers. The Paris of Cezanne. Gentlemen, the toast is Cezanne. It's a funny cool man. <laughs> 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 a funny cool man. I moved into a garret which I shared with several other impoverished artists. There was me, little Billy, my best friend, incredibly tiny Fred, <laughs> economy size Alf, and relatively enormous Cyril. And although we were cold, hungry, miserable, damp and poor, somehow, when we were together, it was very much worse. <laughs> but we got by somehow. Ça va, little Billy? Ça va, incredibly tiny friend. Oh, where have you been? To the flea market and see what I bought. Eh, fine flea! Tonight we dine royally. Oh, and if, uh, <laughs> if we are careful, there'll be enough for sandwiches for tomorrow. Yes. <laughs> well said, relatively enormous Cyril. Bags I the wishbone. Bags I what? Bags I the wishbone. Oh, yes, of course you are. <laughs> How is the painting going, incredibly tiny Fred? Oh, not bad. This is my latest in the 18th century manner. Cupid in Aphrodite's bedchamber. <laughs> After what? Oh. So I see. <laughs> Come in. My name is Trilby. Forgive the intrusion, but I was told there's a room to let. Oh, I'm sorry, it is taken. Can't I move in with you and share your gay bohemian life? There's no place here for a woman. But I could cook for you. Well, we do our own cooking. I could darn your clothes. We do our own darning. There must be something I can do for you. Trilby moved in next day. <laughs> She wanted to become a singer, and I helped her as best I could, struggling through her Tosca on the piano, and uh, whenever she asked, running through her Donizetti. Dear, dear little Billy, can we try it just once more? All right, then, and then we must stop. My tiny hands are frozen. <laughs> One, uh, two. How was I that time? Well, uh... <laughs> better, but it still lacks a little something. Perhaps, perhaps if I tried it without the trumpet and the handkerchief. Yes. <laughs> you see, you see, I've never had any proper training. My agriculturers need polishing. Yes, I like them the way they are. I mean, <laughs> or indeed, the occasional wipe down with a damp chamois. <laughs> No, no, no. I must get a proper teacher. Incredibly tiny, Fred. Uh, look in the paper under Les Classified. Ah, oui. Ah, here we are. Mm -hmm. Full-size reproduction of the Eiffel Tower, seven francs. Postage and packing, 12 million francs extra. <laughs> yes, now let me see. Oh, yeah, tuition various. Uh, oh, you don't want to learn that. Um, and you already know how to do that. <laughs> That looks interesting, but I don't think we've got the room for it. There, there, look. Professor Sven Galli, singing teacher, hypnotist, abductor of innocent girls' competitive prices. Oh, satisfaction guaranteed. Don't go to him, he's notorious. He'll lead you astray. He'll get you in his power and make you his slave. There's nothing he won't stoop to to satisfy his evil desires. Nothing? Nothing. 
She'll be enrolled next day. <laughs> so, you are Svengali, the evil mastermind whose vile pursuits are a synonym for all that is bestial and base. Oh, no, dearie, I'm Mrs. Bulstrode, the char. <laughs> yes. Mr. Mr. Svengali's in the scullery hypnotising a cheese. Yes. I'll call him. Oi, Arthur! Shop! Ah, uh, uh. uh, my dear. Pray accept an old loony's welcome. So you want me to teach you my method? Yes, and to sing too. Uh, <laughs> How did you hear of me? Why did you come to me? All Paris speaks of your strange behaviour. <laughs> oh, they say you have no scruples. It is true, but what need have I of scruples? All I want are material things, money, houses, women, Batman, Jim Jams. <laughs> All the trappings of luxury. I'll stop at nothing to get what I want. And I want you, Trilby. Ah, I want you for my slave. Your slave? Yes, he hasn't got a Trilby. Ah. <laughs> I... I will make you a great singer. Ah, I've taught them all. Jenny Lind, the Swedish nightingale. Cilla Black, the Liverpool ostrich. Oh. <laughs> Dame Nellie Melba, Mrs. Miller. Mrs. Miller? You should have heard her before she came to me. <laughs> fall in love with me, my pupils. That's why I had to stop teaching Harry Seacombe. <laughs> uh, but you, you are different from Harry Seacombe, that is. Do you really think so? Yes, you may not be as pretty, but you're different. <laughs> oh, by George, you're different. Oh, that's the nicest thing anyone has ever said to me. Svengali, I am yours. Good girl. <laughs> Lie on this couch, and I'll show you my method. Now, look, look at this small, shiny object I'm gangling in front of you. Now, concentrate, don't go to sleep. Deeper, deeper, you are completely in my power. Now sing, my little beauty, sing. Now this is not the one that my story's just begun rolling over. Not you, dear. <laughs> not you, Mrs. Balstrode. Get on with the housework. All right, Arthur. <laughs> oh, oh, she's a trial. <laughs> Three, three and six an hour, you can't grumble. <laughs> no, no, Trilby. Trilby, my child. Ah, oh, you are hypnotised. When I snap my fingers, you will sing as you've never sung before. As I have never sung before. Right. One, two. Come to love a car with sugar of whiskey. I will be Yes. This is going to take longer than I thought. <laughs> With Trilby completely under Svengali's spell, little Billy went downhill fast. His life became one round of drink and women. We do another round of drinks and women. We'll make them large ones. I'll have a rum and coquette. Come here, Fifi darling, you are a pretty little thing. Thank you, sir. I made a special effort. <laughs> You, Smith, a creature of the half-world? Yes, it was the only part left. Well, <laughs> so you might at least have done it in a high-pitched voice. Little Billy! Uh, what is it, incredibly tiny Fred? This life you are leading is no good. No. What are you doing with a woman like this? You must stop it. Please, stop it! At least when I'm talking to you. <laughs> Tell me, need. Trilby, but she's the most famous singer in Paris now. She doesn't need me. She has Svengali. She misses you, little Billy. Won't you see her? She sings tonight at the opera house. I have a little box, little Billy. Have you incredibly <laughs> tiny friend? <laughs> Come, little Billy, to the opera. <laughs> Come, 
Meanwhile, backstage at the Opera House, Trilby and the evil mentor are preparing for the performance. Ah, uh, there, my dear, a little eye shadow, a hint of rouge, and there a beauty spot, and just a little powder. There, how do I look? Very nice. But what about me? I'm so terribly nervous. Oh, I don't think, I don't think I can go on. You must go on. You must. You hear? You've got to do it, kid. This is your big break, kid. You, I want to stand. They believe in you out there. I believe in you, kid. You're going to be a star. I spend golly all to you. You don't be afraid. I shall be with you. I am right behind you. Urging you on. Yes, that's another matter. Please, Mr. Sven Gali, when I'm singing, do you have to hide under my crinoline? <laughs> Aha, Sven Gali. Aha, little Billy. Ah, there it goes, Sven Gali. You can bring her nothing but misery. Nobody will have her but me. Stand back. He's got a knife. With an attachment for getting things out of horses' hooves. <laughs> Quick, somebody distract him with a horse. Here, Dobbin. <laughs> it is I, Douglas the Wonder Horse Smith. <laughs> In a skin. Limp, limp. Why, look, Svengali, this announcer disguised as a horse has a thing in its hoof. Ah, I have just the implement for removing, same. Allow me, Dobbin. While his attention was thus distracted, I leapt on him. We grappled. Ah! <laughs> Don't look, my dear, he's not a pretty sight. Is he? Yes. <laughs> yes. Dead. <laughs> Impaled on his own attachment for getting things out of horses. <laughs> So Svengali perished, but without him, Trilby's voice had gone. She sank lower and lower until the BBC, in their infinite wisdom, took pity on the poor creature and did the only thing they could for the piteous wretch. They entered her for the Eurovision Song Contest, <laughs> 1887. And talking of piteous wretches, here are the Fraser Hayes Four. And if I dangle this shiny object in front of them, it's half a crown, actually, they will burst into It's a Good Day. Ladies and gentlemen, the Fraser Hayes Four. <laughs> It's a good day for singing a song And it's a good day for moving along Yes, it's a good day, how could anything go wrong? A good day from morning to night Yes, it's a good day for shining your shoes And it's a good day for losing the blues Everything to gain and nothing to lose Cause it's a good day from morning to night I said to the sun, good morning Sun. Rise and shine today You know you gotta get going If you're gonna make a showing And you've got to ride away Cause it's a good day For paying your bills And it's a good day For curing the real So take a deep breath And throw away your bills It's a good day from morning till night Yes, it's a good day
And now, the round the horn colour supplement. This week in black and white. Now, first, great classic dishes of France. And here with the recipe is Bonne Femme, better known as Daphne White Thigh. In this series, I have already told you how to prepare chicken in the basket, turkey in the straw, dog in the manger, and cat on a hot tin roof. <laughs> this week, I'm going to tell you a couple of things any housewife can do with a rhinoceros. <laughs> First, you take your rhinoceros and pluck it. <laughs> don't, don't throw away the hooves. They'll come in useful if you ever want to make rhinoceros foot jelly. Now, sprinkle your rhinoceros with caraway seed and wrap him in tinfoil. <laughs> You'll need 57 yards. <laughs> Add a walrus cube to give it man appeal <laughs> and pop the rhino in the oven, or as much as you can get in. <laughs> Roast on a low light for 18 months and serve with rather a lot of chips. <laughs> To be honest, rhinoceros is not very appetizing, but you do get marvelous crackling. <laughs> and uh, next week, Daphne will be back to tell us what to do with those whale leftovers. <laughs> and now, uh, uh, around town, Sunday night personality Seamus Android interviews film star Rock Catamore. Hello, well now, all right. <laughs> Well, we've had a bit of fun, and to, <laughs> and to start off first with, firstly, Rock, I'd like to ask you one last question <laughs> before we start. <laughs> All right. No. <laughs> well, it's been most interesting hearing your opinions, but that's all we've got time for, so it's good night now from Shimmer's Android. Yes. <laughs> Thank you, Seamus Android, the man of the day. The day being gloomy Sunday. <laughs> and so to... Uh, so to what's on in London with Brad Smallpiece. Ah? Uh, well, it's all been happening on the swinging London scene this week. There's the policeman's puma crouching at Wimbledon. <laughs> vestigial gnome tumbling at Luton Hoo, And a display of traffic warden mincing at the Alhambra foot bath. <laughs> But I myself would plump for the nudist hop, step and jump contest in the deep freeze at Waldridge's. <laughs> Clapton Common. And there'll be edited highlights after the epilogue. And I can't wait for the slow motion sequences. However, this week... This week, the colour supplement takes a look at the British press. British newspapers are much maligned. People say that their function is much better performed by television and radio newscasters, but you can't wrap your chips in Michael Aspel with <laughs> vinegar drips out of his pockets. <laughs> and you can't spread Robin Day out on the floor for the dog, however much you'd like to. <laughs> Still, newspaper men are a hardy and adventurous breed, but the good reporter should be able to turn his hand to anything. Ah, loom bucket. I'd like a word with you. Yes, Chief? When we transferred you from the sports page to the society column, we hoped you'd leave the jargon of the football field behind you. How uh, do you mean, Chief? Well, look at your column for yesterday. You do not refer to the Duke of Cumberfold's new wife as £20,000 buy from West Bromwich. <laughs> well, sir, I mean... Whatever her reasons may have been for marrying him, And when referring to his ex-wife, you say they were divorced on the grounds of incompatibility, not he put her on the transfer list because <laughs> she lost her form. <laughs> and, and another thing, and finally, and finally, when you're covering Lord Mulstrangle's garden party, which incidentally takes place on the lawn, not on the pitch. <laughs> You do not refer to the gracious guests as those hooligans on the terraces. Oh, I'm sorry, sir. If you don't watch it, you'll be selling papers, not writing them. Oh, right, sir. Sorry. And the newspaper sellers, they too have a language of their own. You all about it, you don't You do all about it, you don't about it, you don't about it, you don't Excuse me, excuse me, my good man. Can 
you, can you please direct me to Trafalgar Square? Mm. Yes, lady, you go up for it, 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 Before the days of newspapers, the events of the day were retailed by the street ballad singers. <laughs> and here to sing one such 18th century ditty, the ballad of the Wogglers Mooley, <laughs> is rambling Sid Rumper. <laughs> now, what exactly is a Wogglers Mooley? Well, a Mooley is a sort of smoked cuttlefish of the Welk family, huh? or brother-in-law, you might say. Yes. And they were considered <clears throat> a great delicacy in those days. And, of course, they had to be woggled before you could eat them. Yes, of course. Now, nowadays, you can get them frozen and pre-woggled, but they, they don't taste the same, do they? No, no. Now, this is a sad story that first appeared in 1738 on a broadsheet, and I've set it to a tune of that time, which I found in my gander bag covered in loom powder and fish, fish paste. Fish paste. Yes, what exactly is loom powder? If I started explaining that, we'd be here all night. <laughs> No, so to the sun. <clears throat> Joe, he was a young court wangler. Munging greebles he did go. And he loved a bogler's daughter by the name of Chiswick Flo. <laughs> Vain she was, and like a grasset, though her gander parts were fine. But she sneered at his cord wangle as it hung upon the line. <laughs> so he stole a woggler's mooley for to make a wedding ring. But the Bow Street runners caught him, and the judge said he will swing. Oh, they hung him by the postern, nailed his moody to the fence. <laughs> for to warn all young court wanglers that it was a grave offence. <laughs> There's a moral to this story, though your court wangle be poor. Keep your hands off others' moolies, for it is against the law. <laughs> and thank you, Rambling Sid. I, I feel there's a warning for us all there. <laughs> He who steals my Wogglers Mooley steals trash. <laughs> now, many people complain that they are misrepresented by the press and the reporters don't respect their privacy. Now, this certainly hasn't been my experience until last Tuesday, when two representatives of the Fourth Estate came to interview me. Good morning, I'm Julian. This is my friend Sandy. Good morning. Hello, hello, hello. Hello, hello. Hello, hello. Hello, hello. Yes, we're from the Daily Polari. Yes. <laughs> He's the man you follow around, and I'm the one you can't gag. Oh, can't gag. True. Can't Can we gag. have five minutes for your time? Well, it depends what you want to do with them. Oh! Well, <laughs> well our editor said, why don't you troll off up to Mr. Orne's Latty? That's flat or house, translator's note. Ah, yes, that's right. And have a Polari with him, you yeah, see. Yes, Polari. we'd like to have something hot and personal. Mm. Well, how, uh... <laughs> <laughs> how about this mustard plaster? No. Oh. No, thanks. We just had breakfast. Yeah. <laughs> now, how did you two become news hounds? Well, uh, we was Aunt Ada. You know Aunt Ada. Yes. yes. Advice to the love lawn. The love lawn, you know, polones with pimples in love with older men, you know. <laughs> All that sort of thing. And you advised them? Yes. Well, we'd done yes. what we could, yeah, we but could. we ran into a few snags, didn't we? Oh, no. Say that again. <laughs> oh, hi. Yes. Oh. yes. <laughs> Well, what about, well, for instance, Indignant of Chatham. Remember him, Sam? Do I? Oh, Indignant oh, of Chatham, oh, do I? It's etched on my memory, that is, Indignant of Chatham. More of a deal. Oh, yes. yes. He took your advice? Yes, yes and he's still indignant. Yes. <laughs> yes. And is that to move from Chatham? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> 
What about the what about that curly of Wimbledon? Oh, oh. yeah, he had a personal problem. <laughs> we told him what to do in a plain envelope. Yeah. <laughs> oh no! Oh no! And what's more, I tried to. <laughs> It was absolutely useless. Ian, are you Curly from Wimbledon? <laughs> not, uh, not anymore. I'm not, thanks to your advice. Still, it's cured the blushing. Yeah. yeah. Now, what did you come to see me about? Well, we heard you done something absolutely staggering with a marrow. <laughs> marrow at the church hall. Yeah. Oh, church hall. Oh yes, the vicar's wife was astounded. Now, <laughs> Yes, well, we can't go back to our editor with a story about how you won a prize for a marrow. Not likely. No, I mean, where's work. the titillation in there? No, titillation. No. Well, we've got to tart the story up somehow. Whip out your reporter's companion. Oh. <laughs> and, and, um, yeah, and, uh, and take this down, dictation, take this down. Now, yeah. Mr. Horn, let me see. Um, is that a picture hmm. of you on the wall? Yes, it was taken when I was 18 months uh, on a bearskin rug. Oh, it is a good likeness. Mm. <laughs> right, get this down, Jewel. Kenneth yeah. Horn, former nude photographic model. <laughs> Let me see. You won this competition, did you? Yeah. Yes. The, did the vicar chant an entrance fee? Uh, yes, there was a small chant. Right, yes, Jewel, I've got it. I've, I've got it. I've got the headline. Mm. Kenneth Horn, nude photographic model, admits vicar's charge. <laughs> They printed it and, of course, I complained. And the next week they published an apology, blazoned in letters nearly an eighth of an inch high, next to the chest problem. <laughs> Cheerio. See you next week. That was Round the Horn, starring Kenneth Horn, with Kenneth Williams, Hugh Paddock, Betty Marsden and Bill Pertwee. On the musical side, you heard the Fraser Hayes 4 and Edwin Braden on the Hornblowers. The script was written by Barry Chalk and Marty Feldman, and the show is produced by John Simmons.